Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 16 of the Friends Per Second podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it is just about the beginning of March 2023, and we got a lot to talk about. I am your host this week, Jake Baldino. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Skillup, who is graciously hosting this video on his channel, but the podcast audio version is available everywhere, of course. Uh, Lucy James from Giant Bomb and GameSpot, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am alive. That's what I said to you after the, before the podcast. That's, fine that's all I really U got. Ubisoft title from 2012. Don't even get me started on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but last but certainly not least, uh, Gerard couldn't make it this week, but we are joined by Blessing Adioye Jr. How are you? I'm doing awesome. How's it going? Uh, you are. This is second time. The second time. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, Thank you so much for having me back. You. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. First time through. Sorry to interrupt you. I was just saying everyone loved you the first time through, man. So we had to have you back. Comment section was just all about the blessing. So it had to happen. Hell yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad that me talking about FIFA for a good portion of that podcast <laughs> wasn't right. enough for you guys to keep me away. So I'm, I'm glad to be back here. The fact yeah, that we survived. were willing to listen to someone speak about FIFA for more than like, I don't know, six seconds, that says something. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's that's Hell yeah. That's and the British person wasn't I wasn't there when you were on. Yeah. I, you had no mm. one to back you up, but you did. I mean I'm not a sports ball person. Come on. I'm I can talk about it more on this not, podcast. You're not into football. Come on now. I have been a mascot at a game before, which is big <laughs> in the UK because yes. we don't really do the mascot shit. But Wait, what mascot was it? What, what animal? Oh, no, no, no. Not like an animal. Like, I was a child mascot. That sounds like a horror what? movie. Wait, I was so a you, child mascot. For real? You weren't in a suit? <laughs> it was just you weren't in a mascot? No. Yeah, I was. Well, no. They also misprinted my name in the fucking brochure. So it's like Lucy Jones. How do you misprint Lucy? <laughs> Lucy okay, Jones. No. I got Lucy oh, Jones. I see. But yeah, not nice. for Sunderland AFC when I was about eight. And I had to go onto the pitch and I, and I. Uh, missed the ball when I kicked the first time, but then I scored a goal, which was definitely all because of my skill and not because whatever goalkeeper let me do it. Also, I had to go into the changing rooms. That was weird because there were dudes just in towels and like all the football players. It was a different time. Why did you have to go into the changing room? What a <laughs> story. Because it was a tour. Is... <laughs> it was a tour. And no. now we're going to take the children into the room with the naked men. Yes, that's so, right, please. So that's I right. definitely remember one of them was Niall Quinn. There was a picture of me. Oh, you'll get my dad to dig it out. It's quite funny. There's a picture of Niall Quinn who's clearly just stepped out of a shower and he's got a towel around him and he's just gingerly putting his arm around me and I'm just beaming because I have no idea what I'm doing or why I'm there. <laughs> so... <laughs> that <laughs> mascots in the UK work so differently yeah. than they do in the, in the, really yeah. the US. Yeah. I'm so it's confused. Really you weren't in a costume. <laughs> like yeah. it but wasn't like the the Sunderland Tigers with like you know a cool costume. Where it was just it was just you. You had to kick a ball to a goal. And then um. So, and then they brought you into a dressing room. <laughs> and, then, and then I think Cascada played. I think one of those like late '90s club bangers. Oh like, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think yeah. I think they sang. I think it was my. It must be like the first match of the season or something. And my granddad was there too, and <laughs> this sounds like a fucking fever dream. <laughs> Really, Maybe does. you're worried, painting a picture I'm right now. The further that we go, we're going to unlock some memories, and I'm really scared what we're going to find. No, it, was it actually wasn't a soccer game. It was a bar mitzvah. It was, <laughs> it was a really lovely, lovely experience. Um, and when you missed the ball, that's when you became a gamer. A ga oh that yeah, day. no, that was the last. That's the origin story. Piece of physical activity. I <laughs> that's when Lucy Jones yeah. became Lucy James. <laughs> <laughs> it changed her last name. <laughs> I moved to America uh, 15 years yeah. after that. Anyway. Oh, man. Uh, we do have a lot to talk about this week, so let's just uh, jump into it. Uh, the big thing, the big story is Suicide Squad. Uh, this kind of popped off during a state of play that went down last week uh, where Rocksteady showed off a bunch of gameplay and uh, the takes were wild from social um, media to downvotes on YouTube. Uh, it hasn't been received very well uh ralph would you like to give the spark notes as to why um well i think there's a few reasons i think number one people were naturally quite cautious about this when they heard that rocksteady was making a looter shooter and they also knew it was live service um 
these, this information was already out there before, like for quite a while, in fact. But, and people were a little bit skeptical, but a lot of people, myself included, were very much like, nah, man, they're going to put their own spin on it. It's going to be fucking sick. Just you wait and see, man. Rock steady. Like they don't miss, whatever. And then I think this trailer was an important one because it actually showed real, like proper gameplay as opposed to really quickly cut up trailer stuff. Uh, and it also showed the back end of, you know, in terms of menus, in terms of gear, in terms of their plans for battle passes and cosmetics and all that. So you got to see warts and all, well, not the fully, but you got to see a good chunk of what this experience is actually going to be like. And it really seems like everyone's kind of worst nightmare from a, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. live service perspective. It's kind of like, what game would you absolutely not want Rocksteady to make? Probably something like this, you know, which obviously I think as well, we should say we shouldn't prejudge it. We haven't played it. We yeah. don't know, right? And it could end up being extraordinary for all we know. What, but based upon what we've seen, based upon what these type of games are, based on what they've been in the past, uh, just based on that gameplay. And I, I guess another complaint that people had was about how homogenized mm-hmm. a lot of the character designs were. As in, they look different, but they all kind of play different. And Captain Boomerang's running around with a sniper rifle and SMG and King Shark's got a minigun and... It's like, what are we doing here? Do you know what I mean? So there was just in every category, like gameplay and monetization and itemization and whatever. It was just not clicking with people. And yet the reveal went very, very badly. I I can't recall public perception swinging against the game so quickly in in one fell swoop. Like this is. Oh, what about what about that card? There was a card where it went pretty. Was it like because, a oh, and and do you I remember, find audiences yeah. are so fickle anyway. So. Finicky, but I, rem- I remember just seeing, I, I, I haven't remembered dunks like that COD. Sure. Reveal. But I think sure. the thing with Suicide Squad is, and yeah, it's like I'm trying not to judge it because I haven't mm. played it yet and I love Rocksteady as a studio. The Arkham games are some of my favourites of all time. I think the unfortunate proximity to Gotham Knights there were always rumors that they were both kind of making the same game. And unfortunately, yeah, definitely looks that way. And I think the Gotham Knights has soured people in a way that they don't they don't want more of that. They want more of what what made Rocksteady great, which was mm. the melee combat. And you know what I fucking love about Arkham City and Arkham Asylum and Arkham Knight is all the times you shoot guns. Oh no, wait, that doesn't happen because it's all melee and gadget focused. And no, now it's shooting purple weak points for massive damage. The purple weak points part was the goofiest part of the whole trailer, by the way. For anyone that didn't see it, like imagine every enemy, including tanks and helicopters, had these big purple pustules on them, which were obviously the weak spots. To the be fair, it makes end. sense canonically with Brainiac's method of control. Actually, it would be I like think that. you'll find Sorry. it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, comic book Simpsons, Simpsons comic book guy. Thank you very Nerd. much for that. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, you're right. <laughs> you're, you're, right. Okay, look, you're right. Sure. Okay. It makes sense canonically, but at the same time, it also is just kind of like, is that what, what, is that what we're doing here? We're shooting purple, purple glob things for- 500 hours while leveling our battle pass and, you know, killing Batman for the 85th time. And I don't know, man. It's just... Oh, it <laughs> the Kill Batman it Raid. Yeah. Oh, my God. Kill Batman Raid. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. I, I think the Sorry. thing that brings it down for me is it being Rocksteady. You know, like it, it being Rocksteady and it being yes. Suicide Squad. If this was a random developer and it was a, hey, here's a new IP we're working on that is this multiplayer co-op shooter type game. If this was Outriders... I think the reception would look way different, partly because like you look at Outriders and you're like, oh, this game looks fine. This game looks like a fun game. And watching the Suicide Squad kill the Justice League gameplay during the state of play, there were moments where I was like, oh, this looks like a fun time, you know, like hopping around in, in air, getting headshots is dead shot, you know, taking taking down waves of enemies with my friends. That sounds like a fun time when I am playing a Borderlands or I am playing an Outriders. But when you take that and you put Rocksteady on it and you put Suicide Squad on it, I think expectations turn different where Mm -hmm. Lucy mentions, yeah, like you love Arkham City, you love Arkham Asylum because of the melee combat system. You love it for the story. You love it for the characters. You love it for the world building. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League doesn't seem to be taking advantage of a lot of the things that we know Rocksteady uh, is good at. And then Mm -hmm. on top of that, they are delivering a type of game that 
you know, I don't, I just don't think a lot of people believe in unless your names are Bungie, right? Like they talk about, yeah. they talked about continual updates. They talked about, Hey, we're adding in characters down the line. You, they open up the menu and you see the gear system that looks like in a live service type gear system where you're equipping different types of guns that you're unlocking and different types of um, um, wearables and for different parts of your body and all that stuff. They have those systems in there. And then there's another tab that says battle pass up in there. And, Mm. You know, again, when we think of that type of stuff and we think about the people that do it well, you think about Destiny, you think about uh, maybe Battle Royale style games like Fortnite. Fortnite yeah. But when you're, ta- when you're talking about games as a service specifically, that it, where it is, we're going through, we're doing co-op shooting, doing whatever. You look at Destiny as the blueprint, but then when you start to list off other games that do that well, the list feels fairly short. It's you know, graveyard. like yard. It's a literal graveyard yeah. of people that tried. Like in the well, last few yeah. months, we've seen a lot of games shut down that have tried that yeah. thing. That's exactly what I was about to say. Not only proximity to Gotham Knights and all the stuff that people didn't like about that game, but we are in a weird place right now where post pandemic, well, I mean, pandemic's still ongoing. You know what? You know what I mean. Post uh, sure. lockdown and everything, and people playing fewer games, we are seeing live service games drop like flies. And there were a number, you know, in the month, even just the month before they showed this mm. off and it's it's hard if even something attached to an ip as huge as the avengers couldn't make it for a yeah. multitude a multitude of reasons but you know that exhaustion against this type of this type of live service game was kind of already there and it's like i know that's i i am still gonna play suicide squad because i love rocksteady i want to believe and i hope that there really is like that good game in there but i tell you when they tabbed over to the gear system i (laughs) just could not give less of a shit about any of it because it's a chore and i say this as someone who has been peer pressured into downloading destiny downloading right now that was that was my that was my doing (laughs) yeah so i i I almost made like a do it for him simpsons meme (laughs) with you but (laughs) but i but i mean i think i think as well with this whole rocksteady thing it's like I'm very much in favor of developers making games outside their wheelhouse because, you know, I do speak to developers and they get really bored making the same type of game over and over again, you know, like uh, a whole bunch I've spoken to. And so they're like, I would love to try a different genre, different this. And I'm like, I really support that. But I think with this, it's kind of like, I don't know that this is really being made for like pure reasons, if that makes sense. This doesn't feel like a passion project. You know, you you look at- at you look at Evil Within to Hi-Fi Rush and it's like, oh, somebody on the team really wanted to make Hi-Fi yes. Rush and they made it and it was different and it was fresh and it was really good. I don't totally. I, I feel like when it comes to a live service type game where the care and again, we're I'm prejudging, but I we can judge the things that we've seen, right? Because we've seen sure. the the characters and cutscenes to me have struck me as somewhat uh, not fresh, like somewhat generic, you know, like this looks like a this it looks like they're fitting Suicide Squad into a category that it doesn't fit for. When you're talking about a live service thing, where you are where you are shooting the re- the weak points, where you are playing as King Shark versus Deadshot versus Harley Quinn, and there are different characters. King Shark is supposed to be this hulky, tanking t- kind of character, but it looks like they all play the same, right? They're all flying for some reason, which why I don't is know. Harley th- Quinn like Spider Man? I don't understand what's happened. How does this? How why does are this all happen? of them in the sky? Right? Like what's what? cool, what's going on here? If, if this doesn't strike me as something where on the team there, and maybe I'm wrong, of course, like this is us guessing, but. It doesn't strike me as a thing where people on the team were like, hey, we got to make this Suicide Squad game and also live service. Like, we got to go for live (laughs) service with a battle pass. I've always wanted to make a game with a battle pass in it. Like, that doesn't strike me as a thing. It's like, it's because I think there are so few studios that have managed to deliver a level of immersion like Rocksteady have, Mm. have delivered immersion. Like, the way that they did Batman, what that meant for Batman as a character, for third person melee action games for superhero games for metroidvanias for like whatever it's just that was that was such a transformative trilogy and very few developers could have pulled that off and to go from something that values immersion so much like the whole it makes you feel like batman thing that fucking came from rocksteady that meme came from them you know what i mean and then you get a game that does not at all remotely look like it's going to make you feel like Harley Quinn. <laughs> he makes Damn. this ma- this next Rocksteady game with the Suicide Squad will make you feel like Spider-Man while you're playing it, right? As you're playing as Harley Quinn. And that's ridiculous, you know? And I think that's it, probably it even, why- It'll just make you feel like a menu. 
and stats and <laughs> loot gear and stuff. It's like everything in these types of yeah. games by nature, which you can you can love stats, RPG, loot, even season passes if you want. Uh, but in a game that also like wants to seemingly tell a compelling story, it's almost like clashing. It's almost like at odds totally. with, but, with but the I, ethos. I, I, I definitely expect it'll be that thing that Avengers did where it's like, well, we're going to have a campaign that's for your single player folks and it's going to be, you know, mission based and it's going to have cutscenes and whatever. And then you'll finish it. And then all the other folks who want to stick around and grind out the stuff and whatever, you can do that. And it's like, OK, well, fair enough. I mean, sure. It, in theory, mm. you'd think you get to have the best of both worlds. But our experience with these sorts of games is you actually don't get to have the best of both worlds. You get a significantly compromised single player experience. Because vast amounts of development resources have been poured into making all of that other stuff. That also really undermines some like core gameplay elements. Like, for example, like delivering a really good, satisfying loot system in a in a um in a looter shooter during its campaign, exceedingly rare, because they want to save the most exciting stuff for the end game. Which means that as you're leveling up through most of these games, the gear feels like shit. Or it's like, oh, this one has four more damage. And it's purple instead of blue. I better equip it. You know what I mean? You don't give a shit about any of that stuff. Or versus like if you had, you know, a special Batarang that Batman crafted for you personally. And, you know, you had to go on a quest to find it. And it, you know, massively transformed your play style. That's cool. And that's the kind of stuff I wanted to see out of Gotham Knights. It never happened, of course. We just got the generic stat sticks and colors. Um, and it looks like this will be what's happening here with Suicide mm. Squad as well. But again, we don't know for sure. We well, wait, um, th there was that mission in Gotham Knights where it was a side mission for, I think, Barbara. And it was like going around and, oh, Batman's left caches of stuff around. And oh, it, was, yeah. it wasn't it was even anything. Yeah, that's good. right. Like, exactly. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm afraid of. And I don't want to be afraid of it because I love Rocksteady, <laughs> but I don't want to be afraid of it. No, I don't want to be afraid anymore. No, it's like. <laughs> <clears throat> is this the trade-off that we're going to... I mean, game development is so expensive. Is this the trade-off we have to expect to even get these licensed things anymore? I feel like fewer and fewer risks, especially... I mean, t putting to one side Warner Brothers Discovery and the absolute shitfest that whole thing has been that and what that company is going through right now, like... Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, look, I think the... the there's also a failure of marketing a little bit with yeah. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League where the game is out in a few months now and this is the the deepest dive that we've gotten into the game, which makes sense. But, you know, I, I think the loot game slash live service slash battle pass aspect uh, has caught a lot of people as a surprise. It was leaked a few months ago yeah. that they had a battle pass. And we saw the menu uh, yeah, with yeah. that in there. But yeah, when that hit, a lot of people were like, oh, it has a battle pass. Interesting. And now that we're seeing it live in action, I think now we've gotten the realization of, hey, this is the reality check of what Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is. Are you in or are you out? And for most of the player base that I think would have been into this game, I think the answer for most of them is I'm out because of the yeah. kind of game that it is where you watch that first trailer, you watch the second trailer. I don't think they did a, a great job of being, of being like, hey, this is what this game is. We knew we knew it was multiplayer, right? They, I remember reading the when they first the, uh, revealed it. Well, I think it was at the the dome, <laughs> the um, WB uh, oh, fan dome. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that might have been when they revealed it. But I remember after they revealed it, there was a press release that went up, and I read the press release, and in there they said third person shooter and i remember reading that being like this that can't be right right like this is a third person this doesn't look like a third person shooter and now that i'm seeing the game I'm like oh no that makes sense <laughs> this is for sure a third person shooter but i think from the first couple of trailers where you're getting a lot of cinematics and you're getting a lot of tastes of hey rocksteady's back this game is in the rocksteady arkham universe and also you're playing these characters and it's very cinematic focus you are not getting a sense of what the actual game is and so when people actually got when people actually get that the full sense of what the game is, I think that backfires a little bit when it's something that they don't expect. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely. hard because I love like even what we've seen so far, like I love the storytelling angle. I love seeing mm. these characters. I like seeing rocks that he's spin on them. It, it says a lot, even when it's uh, the suicide squad who a lot of people would argue right now are like overexposed. It's like, all right, you guys have had how many movies and like what, what else are we do with these guys? But the fact that rocks that he's doing it, and I still want to see it. I'm not tired of it just because I like their spin on things. Uh, like, so I'm just kind of like, 
I'm just defensive where I'm like, I don't want this stuff to get in the way of a good story. Like yeah, I want to just so. play through a good thing. I don't want to hear Kevin Conroy's voice for the last time be like, Oracle, I need to grind three rare metals in order to <laughs> unlock this next chess piece. Like, <laughs> it's just not what I'm about. Sure. I think as well, one, one thing that I definitely have realized over the last 18 months is that, you know, the live service market is pretty, I'm not, I wouldn't say set in stone right now, but it's pretty set in stone. And what I mean is that there's a couple of key players and you pick your poison, right? And I personally made a decision about, because I've always played Destiny, for example, and uh, like ever since Alpha, like D1. But I also played other games. Like I also played like some Apex and I played World of Warcraft. I played Final Fantasy 14. I tried to keep up with a number of different live service games. But I eventually reached a point in my life where I'm like, okay, I need to make a choice now because I don't have enough time. So what's it going to be, you know? And I made that choice for Destiny. I'm like, that's the one that I'm going to invest my time in uh, ex- almost exclusively, so to speak. And that's been really liberating in some aspects because it's allowed me to sort of like go deeper into Destiny and do some things that I might not otherwise have done because I'm trying to spread myself thin across other, you know, live service games. Um, but at the same time, it means that I have not experienced those other games and haven't played the latest expansion of Final Fantasy fourteen, for example, even though I'd love to do that. My point with all of this is that, like, I think a lot of people have made a decision similar to that at this point with the live service landscape. They've decided they're an Apex main or they play Fortnite or they play WoW or whatever. And that's it. And when another like game comes along trying to like mm, sort of shoulder barge into that, it's a really, really tough thing to dislodge those people from those existing live service experiences and ask them to invest in something wholly new. It has to be a really great offering to like, you know, do that. Will Suicide Squad be that good? I don't know, but it's like a really, really, really tall order, you know, so. Yeah, Lucy mentioned earlier um, that the space has changed a lot when it comes to even just games as a service based on a lot of games shutting down recently, right? And like people are, people aren't stuck at home as much, right? Like the, I, I think things are kind of settling yeah. um, you know, as we've gone, uh, gotten further and further in through the pandemic, I look at something like multiverses where multiverses came out in August ish and had a pretty, um, sizable player base, right? Mm -hmm. People were really digging multiverses. And, you know, I saw a lot of, I saw a bit of mainstream appeal to it. What I, I can, I feel like I can measure how pop, how like popular a game has gotten based on, am I seeing it on TikTok (laughs) or not? And I was, I was in multiverses TikTok. I was seeing a lot of people make like TikToks about multiverses and the different characters and playing as LeBron James and all that stuff. I don't know the last time I've heard somebody organically bring up multiverses. And in fact, there was um, a few weeks ago where I saw an article about how the player bases dropped dramatically yeah. for that game yeah, 99 percent down yeah and that's yeah. that's kind of what we're dealing with when it comes to to live service and i think it's to your point ralph a lot of people have chosen the games that th- that th- they're into and yeah. i wonder how that's going to shape going forward in, in in terms of companies choosing whether or not a thing needs to live on like one of the things i did like about outriders to bring it back to outriders was the fact that when they were asked pre-release like hey so like what what live service game do you uh, stuff do you have in here right is this an, a games or service type game they're like no this is this is just a one and done <laughs> like you yeah. beat the game and the game's done and then later on they released dlc because i think they saw enough um players there to, to do that um and i'm sure they already were in develop- that was already in development but like you know yeah. they did that and then i don't think they've done much since then they're not treating that game as an ongoing game they're treating that game as a game that comes out and then gets dlc afterwards yeah um for suicide squad them talking about adding in characters seeing the battle pass all that stuff is that a game that people are going to want to play month to month like am i going to be re be re- um um uh, returning to that game three months down the line four months down the line for whatever content update <clears throat> they add that's on their um mm-hmm. their calendar i don't think so like that's i can see myself mm-hmm. playing through it for that first week and being like oh i beat suicide squad it's fine it's it's fun it's whatever and then maybe if you do one DLC drop down the road, I can see myself returning to it. But that's not a game that I'm going to want to play every week. That's not a game I don't yeah. think I, I, I'm going to want to play every month. You know, I think it's that's the big like, that's the big hill to climb. Yeah, it's like genres. It, it, it's like the that formula just works better with some genres. I think at least that's my preference. Where like I see Suicide Squad gameplay and I, it looks kind of fun and like you're whipping around and like like you said, blessing at the start where it's like okay, you and three other friends like flying around seems cool. 
But I just don't know if that's like from the way the mechanics work, the way the combat, the shooting works. Like, is there enough in that to make me keep playing for that long? So like, it's almost mm. like certain genres just feel better. A really well-crafted bungee first person shooter, an MMORPG and like cool quests, just other things that entice you to keep playing. Where for me, the only other genre I think will make sense to apply this formula to is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Just do that. <laughs> And I'll do it. I'll pay like yeah, a yeah. monthly subscription. Those are not the words I was expecting to come out your mouth. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Battle Royale. <laughs> you went Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Like, oh, yeah, 100 skaters, 900 onto an <laughs> island. <laughs> Combine like Genshin Impact with Tony Hawk. Make billions. Oh my saying. goodness. Like oh, roller roll drums, for yeah. skaters. skaters and shit. I would buy yeah, so many skaters. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. 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 Did anyone else yeah, think it yeah. was weird that they got Sefton Hill to do that video? For Suicide Squad, <clears throat> by the way. Because, like, he's out. He's yeah. leaving. I don't know who Sefton Hill is. Co-founder like of Rocksteady. Oh, he's the co-founder. Yeah, sure, was, sure, sure. He was creative he's director. Leaving, yeah. He was, like, director on Arkham 1 through 3. And then, you yeah, know, but he, he's leaving. You know, I learned, I learned that the game director, the other game director for um, got, uh, this Suicide Squad was also uh, one of the lead designers on the Division 1 before he left massive oh, hello. <laughs> interesting yeah yeah so he's like that. he has he has form in that category yeah okay. he's is, got I mean, he's division pretty good division was fantastic yeah. obviously but it was another example of just how hard it is to maintain a live yeah. service 100 you know? um and it just it's just yeah proof positive of that and that's another thing that i worry about like you know destiny is what it is uh, and that is a studio of a thousand strong yeah. and all they do is make that fucking game <laughs> and that's it. Uh, they, they are working in other projects right now, yeah. sure. But like in terms of what they've got live, that's it. Uh, I mean, Rocksteady being able to maintain a content cadence. How big is Rocksteady? Uh, I don't know, but like Couple it took points. Bungie so long to get to the point where they could actually do this at a proper cadence. <clears throat> For Rocksteady to get to the point where they can do that and satisfy an audience and actually compete on the live service stage, that is huge. That is a massive drain of resources, time, money, and also attention away from other things that they could be developing. And, you know, and I and I wonder if they have the bandwidth to be able to make a different game after this gets up. Do they need to just focus exclusively on this for two years to stand up the live service elements before they can start thinking about making that Superman game we all want them to make? You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. So, you know, it's been in development for like eight yeah. years. Is it realistically a 10 year development for that? I don't know. So I'm happy to be proven wrong. And with a game oh. involving the Arkhamverse and with Rocksteady, I will be like really happy to be proven wrong. And I'm open for it. Like I'm open to it. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, please prove us wrong, mm -hmm. Rocksteady. Uh, please God. Please make us, please please. Make us look like jerks, essentially. <laughs> well, that would be, that would be sick. Let's move on over to something positive and let's go to a user question, a viewer question. Users. I keep calling them users. How do you keep calling them users? users I'm in the grid. Questions. Podcast users. I'm in the grid. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can send us questions for this podcast. You write in at the very special email that uh, only what Ralph will ever remember. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Contact at friendspersecond.com. There's actually been quite a few questions in the last little while, so thanks for sending those. Yeah. Too. Appreciate it. Yeah, we had a lot to choose through. It's been yeah. hard. Uh, so we're, we're starting off light. We had to lighten it up after that heavy talk. This is from Pet Pumpkin Dev, who asks, if you had to transition into a job unrelated to video games, what would it be? Uh, Lucy, you want to go first? Okay, two, three options. One pet sitter i'm on pet sitter tiktok right now it looks pretty sweet just going into people's houses looking after their pets easy two professional pimple popper aka oh, one of those no. with girls and that why do oh my god do this? Dude, yeah my sister is really into that too what yeah. is with Freaks. females and this it's Female. fucked up <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think it's satisfying and I think it would be great. Uh, three, I would love to be um, one of those professional organizers, but like specifically for rich white women in LA or New York where they pay you a ton of money and you just get to go in and you, or you buy little bins for everything and just all. Are, are just you talking about like being Marie Kondo for yeah. like rich people in SoCal, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I mean genuinely like I don't I don't like if if though if money was like no object and I could just be like my mother who's retired and just randomly picks up hobbies and stuff and like 
she started volunteering at the cat and dog shelter. She started being a receptionist at an estate agent. And I was like, what? And she went, oh, yeah, I've done that for like the last five months. Just didn't tell me. <laughs> just like random little jobs, but she does it just because she's helping people out. I would love to just do stuff like that. Just no real, I just, just like a, like a leaf on the wind of the world going from random job to random job. Yeah. Yeah. But also pimple pop and being a dermatologist would be sick. I would love that. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. Blessing. Uh, oh, this is a tough one. I almost yeah. said game development. I was like, no, that's in video games. Um, <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I would like to be a, a content creator on the music side. I think that'd be pretty fun. Before I joined Kind of Funny, I... Uh, made some video essays about music and like hip hop artists. Um, like I had like a whole video essay about Cardi B that probably didn't age well now that I think about it. But you know, like I enjoyed making music and hip hop video essays just as much as I enjoyed making uh, video game video essays when I did back in the day. And so, yeah, I think being a music content creator would be fun. Um, otherwise, I would also like to work. I would. I would like to make a and d- develop a tabletop game. I think oh, that'd, be pretty, that'd fun. be fun. And like, that's kind of a goal. That's actually one of my goals for the year is I want to start on it. I've not actually said this on content. I've only told close friends this. And so you guys get the exclusive. Nice. Um, I want to actually start work on a tabletop game. I want to try my cool. hand at making one because I really enjoy I, I, I enjoy playing like the casual card games a lot with mm-hmm. friends. I enjoy exploding kittens so much. Uh, the car, the card game, not <laughs> exploding actual kids. Um, <laughs> I had to clarify that so you don't Good put that out of context. <laughs> not going to be a pet sitter then. No, uh, uh, I like uh, deduction games. Uh, you know, one night werewolf, those types of games. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to make, I'd like to make a, a casual game, right? I, w- I wouldn't want to make anything too hardcore or crazy, but stuff that you can play with like any group of friends and have fun, and that could have like fun art on it. I think that type of th- making those types of games would be pretty fun. That's a really good answer. That is yeah. the answer. Yeah, it's way better than mine. Uh, I kind of go to like what my fallback would be if like this all collapses tomorrow. I would like to use my video editing skills, like my trade, uh, to like edit wedding videos for people. I just feel like that's nice. Yeah. Um, it seems like a nice job. Um, <laughs> nice. I also. Why are you, <laughs> you can, laughing you at that. me? You know, no, no. You can do that thing where like you, are, and then they'll ask you like, "Oh, how long until it's delivered?" You're like, "Oh, about six months." You know, that's it. <laughs> Has anyone ever you've ordered the wedding wedding video? Trust me, get a wedding video. Yeah. You will find out the video editor or photographer will be like, "Yeah, I can get that to you in about six months." It's like, why? I know how to edit a video. It doesn't take six months, man. I can turn around in six hours. Just fucking yeah, do come it. Come on. <laughs> so. Exactly. That's the thing. Like, I feel like that the part of my job I like doing the most sometimes is just a big timeline in front of me on an editing program and also if there was a job specifically to fix other people's shit i love frankensteining and fixing and video editing like the magic you can do to like fix things that are like just falling apart like a bad video or like a a messed up edit or like wait so you'd be that video you'd be like one of those guys i get on my instagram stuff where it's like you need me like a to doctor like your videos and come with me on this boot camp for six weeks and I'll teach you how to be a video editor. Except yeah. I get game production ones and that was a bad impression. But <laughs> that was that was a trip. That was yeah. It was. That's, it was. That's what I do. Probably video editor or I really like the jobs that also benefit you. I guess I am not athletic or a fitness person, but I would love to be a personal trainer. It seems great. I look at these fuckers on Peloton all day and I'm like, you get to just do this. And it's a job and you have to work hard, but you also, your body is better for it. Mm. Good for you. That's great. Yeah. That seems That's nice. True. And I would like that. As opposed to this gamer body we get for what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so Move yeah, out of the way, like dad bod. Trader. Gamer bod. <laughs> That's right. Gamer bod is Nick. <laughs> the most powerful uh, thing is in the West. I, I think too, I think I would like to write, but the thing is, I don't believe I could write. Like I... Like, I would like to, like, write a screenplay or a book, but I've never done that before, and I don't have original ideas. Like, I'm really good at being like, this thing sucks, this thing is good. But if, like, <laughs> like you ask me to come up with new ideas, I'm like, um, what What if, um, uh, the Joker, but he was good? You know, like, I've got nothing, you know? <laughs> <did> so, <laughs> like, uh, but I reckon it would be fun to do that. I would really like to do something like that, maybe at some point. Um, or alternatively, I think it would be nice to teach. I like, I don't know. I just think teaching, especially in I don't know, content creation and or, or whatever, like, I just think it would be nice to like teach young people how to do it and give them the right mindset. So, cause it's like, 
it's a shitty world content creation if you come at it in certain angles or you follow the wrong people. And I don't know, I think it'd be just nice to be able to help young people enter this space with the right sort of mindset. That'd be awesome. Yeah, because yeah, like a lot of, I mean, more and more young people are coming up with TikTok and YouTube and stuff at their mm-hmm. disposal. And I don't know if there, there's the education out there to like really effectively sure. no usher them into that world. And so, yeah, having having folks to be like, hey, no, this is the reality of content creation. This is what it's like behind the, st- the scenes. This is what it takes to make a video. All that stuff, I yeah. think, would be very valuable. I was a mentor. Did I tell you guys this a couple of years ago? No. I was a mentor. Um, there's a program run out of the UK called Limit Break, and it's all about connecting people in the games industry um, with kind of people who are more advanced in their field, I guess. And so I was a mentor for three people. It was really oh, fun. Sure. It was all just about... It's, obviously, the, the landscape is very different from when I started, but it was really cool. And I got to make three new friends. And like they all work <laughs> in games. It's really fun. Oh, they do? Yeah. So they, they were kind of like earlier on in their careers, but like one's, oh, right, right, one's okay. at IGN now, one's at Rare, the other one's at Future. So cool. That's cool. I'd want to do that too. I've, I've thought about that. The only thing, especially because like you see content creators make easy mistakes to avoid like every on the daily. Mm. I feel like I just see every day. We also day, make like, those mistakes as well, of course. Absolutely. We've, oh, yeah. we've different mistakes. been through it all. Yeah. Yeah. The only yeah. thing I've always kind of held back from teaching is that I worry, not to get deep, but I worry that... Uh, the this the landscape changes so quickly mm-hmm. and so rapidly that by the time I got set up to actually teach or mentor somebody, yeah. I'd be old hat and like I da- I barely know what I'm talking about. But yeah. like I think there's a difference between I think there are some core fundamentals about what yeah. it means to be in this world and do this thing versus if you want to like pop off and be top of directory on like Twitch or, you know, have, you know, like 70 million followers on TikTok. Like they're different things, you know? And I think that you would, I think all of us would be able to sort of talk about those fundamentals that anyone could take with them wherever they went. And the whole sort of like going viral thing is going to depend on them, their personality, the kind of content they do, who they connect with, all that sort of stuff. That's something that I think that sort of stuff is actually someone no one can teach you. You kind of need to figure that out for yourself with your audience. But like those like fundamentals, I think they're kind of timeless. You know what I mean? I think so. I think there's a lot of transferable skills too. Like Sure. Presenting to a camera, knowing how to talk to people, how to honestly being good at email and responsiveness is a, kind of a big learning. part of it. Networking and <laughs> clickbait. Know. That's a lot. Yeah, how to, make it, how to make a thumbnail. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> you know, so there's a, there's a lot of it. That was a really so, nice question, Pet yeah, Pumpkin. Yeah, it was. Thank you very much, Pet Pumpkin Dev. <laughs> Next up, let's move on over to some video game talk. So just to rattle it off real quick for those of you listening or watching at home. Uh, the release list as of right now, the big thing is PlayStation VR 2, specifically with the Gran Turismo 7 update, a No Man's Sky update for it, Resident Evil Village VR update for it, and the big headlining release for PSVR 2, Horizon Call of the Mountain. Along with that, we also got Blood Bowl 3, Company of Heroes 3, The Sun, or not The Suns, Sons of the Forest, or is it The Suns? No, it's Sons of the Forest. Guns sons. of the Patriots, uh, <laughs> Herbal <laughs> Space Program 2. Octopath Traveler 2, Destiny 2 Lightfall, and uh, <laughs> Wo Long Fallen Dynasty. So I'd like to first kick it off with PSVR 2. Um, I think we've all touched a PSVR 2. Not I... me. Nope. Damn. No. But you haven't. No, not even. Not Have even you been s- into Office? No, I was at Dice. Something? Of course. Of yeah. course. Yeah, sure, um, sure, sure. No, but also I'm... I'm I'm less interested, especially because people are still talking about. I mean, I can, I guess, I can ask you all. How's the motion sickness? Actually, pretty fine. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not good, really. I'm it's, it's not been that bad with me. Um, I, I will say, when I first booted up Horizon, I tried to do like the advanced movement options, and I had to tone that back immediately because it's been a while since I've been in VR. So don't jump in into the deep end like I did. But after I got acclimated again, it was fine um, until I played Kayak VR, which fucked me up. Um, <laughs> so be, VR did. The Kayak game. Yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, Kayak VR fucked me up. <laughs> so be careful if you're still, about to ride still, some kayaks. I still remember when I got my PSVR 1 and I had that game Rigs. 
Oh, so yeah. over this rig game. Yeah. Yes. Dude, and I was so excited for VR. I'm like, hell yeah, man, let's go. Let's put it on, whatever. I lasted like 15 minutes with rigs before I was like sweating. Mm. I was so motion sick and I was just like, I have to stop now. And like, it really scarred me. And it took me a while to like get back on the VR horse because I had such a bad experience with it. Rigs, if anyone doesn't know, was a um, like a mech combat game. Imagine... Like, you know, a big uh, Thunderdome kind of arena with mechs speeding around super fast, shooting each other. And, oh, man, it was just like motion motion sickness fucking city. Who, who so, made yeah. rigs? Oh, it was Gorilla. It was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, was it yeah, Gorilla, Cambridge. Was it? I thought it was London. No, Gorilla oh, it was Cambridge. Cambridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, the big thing, you know, the main thing was Call of the Mountain. And I'm not finished with it, but I like it. You know, in some ways, it feels a little bit like baby's first VR game where it's like, look, ooh, ah. But once you get into it, it's got some like actual video game mechanics that I kind of dug. Uh, I like putting together my tools. I like using different tools. I like kind of doing the Shadow of the Tomb Raider jump to pickaxe on cliff to do that in VR is very satisfying. Uh, and it, it's just cool. The main character sounds like Nick Cage. It's really weird. Oh, um, <laughs> and you get to see Aloy. And that was weird. That's not oh, a spoiler. I did see a screenshot, no, and and she looks really, really small. She's a to, yeah, that's right. You, she's a short queen, as I said. Yeah. <laughs> short queen. I didn't know she was going to be in the game, and it was kind of like a like when your crush like walks in the room and you didn't know they were going to be. I literally, she literally walks in and she's like, "We have to do something about like how she's so serious." Like, shut up. Uh, but I saw her and I was like, I looked at the guy in the game. I was like, Aloy's. You didn't tell me Aloy was going to be here. Oh my god, I love Aloy. <laughs> Uh, would you say, I mean, I've, I've heard mixed things because I know you have a take on this as well, Blessing, but Jake, would you say that Call of the Mountain is a system seller? Because I've no. heard some people say yes. No, it's hard for me, though, because I'm not a ride or die for Horizon. I, I, they're sure. good. I just I'm not like in love with them. So mm. I come at it from that. So it's, it's, it's no. But I think even in terms of. Yeah, I still feel like the only. Yeah, I don't want to get too into it. Yeah, I don't I don't think nah, I don't think so. That's a long complicated yeah. way of saying no. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I t- I tend but, to uh, agree with that. Like I I I think it's beautiful. That's ma- the main thing that the, that is my big takeaway in terms of um what Horizon Call of the Mountain brings to the table is that fidelity wise, that game looks incredible. Uh, to be like climbing and then to, like to reach a um uh the top of a cliff and then look down and be able to just view the landscape uh i think the power of the ps5 and psvr2 really does a lot for what vr is bringing visually or at least for what i've experienced you know i've like i'm coming from uh off of playing psvr1 uh and then also doing stuff with uh the meta quest and so for me this is the some of the best vr fidelity that i've seen i think horizon called the mountain looks gorgeous but in terms of like the gameplay it's still vr like you know almost like an arcade style experience where it is you get <clears throat> you get into combat and you are strafing around in a circle and like you're busting out your bow and arrow and i think the combat is, is fun um but it's not like it's not revolutionary and then like for the for most of the game i want to say like 75 percent of the game you're climbing and mm. um i think that stuff can be hit, hit or miss if you're looking for a climbing video game it's the best climbing video game I've ever played. Uh, did you play the climb, climb though? On, did you play the climb? Uh, actually, no, I didn't play the climb. So yeah, I might be wrong. The climb then. That's the one <laughs> thing is that there's no challenge with with the climbing in Horizon, mm. and I, well, not really, except for a couple of maneuvers where I wish it actually because it's very much ripped from the climb. It feels the same, and I love that game. They made a second one too, and I totally never played it. Uh, but I wish they added a little bit more of an element of challenge to it because you're right, you are climbing. A lot, a lot in that. It all, to the point where my arms were getting tired. Like I would be climbing, and I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I would have to take breaks mid climb, and one arm is just hanging up, and the other arm is I'm letting take a rest. And so literally, I'm in my room <laughs> as if I'm literally like on this cliff, just hanging out. I'm like, all right, switch hands and like cla- grab the cliff, and then like let my other arm rest. It's um, like the one VR action that I feel really pathetic doing, like when I'm in <laughs> seated mode. I feel like I'm Joaquin Phoenix and her. When he's just kind of like doing the thing in the game and I'm just like, I'm like somebody's looking at me through the window right now as I'm playing and I'm just like endlessly climbing like a weirdo <laughs> while sitting on my couch. <laughs> but yeah, like story wise, it's fine. I, I don't yeah. think it's, this is a horizon story that uh, if you're a horizon fan, I don't think it's like 
needed. Like if you're looking for more Horizon and you have VR, then yeah, check it out. But I I don't I for me it's forgettable, right? Like Aloy's in it, but like she's not she's not like a main character in it no. and so you're not missing out on much in terms of her story mm-hmm. um and yeah like the uh, gameplay wise i think it's a fine to good vr game but i wouldn't say that it's like i wouldn't say i wouldn't put it up there with the astrobots of the world or the half-life alexes of the world or even honestly the gran turismo 7s of the world because i haven't played gran turismo 7 yes and that might be a vr seller like that that game is really fun in vr i agree i firmly believe that the main case for gaming in vr still is like the, the where it just translates the best is racing when i first got the oculus rift i did dirt rally i think it was and i was like holy shit this is where the magic is and gran turismo 7 totally straight up same thing mm. right like you just you just feel, it's like as soon as you start driving it's like anyone can just get into it if you can kind of know how to drive a car at least in a video game like you're like okay i look around here's the mirrors like it, it just it's such a natural thing where still a a shooter or like a combat game in vr isn't totally natural driving in vr is in my yeah. opinion yeah i mean i think to this day still the best vr experience i've ever had was star wars squadrons um yeah. which is obviously not a racing game but like the idea of being in a cockpit and having yeah. to steer something is just and also what's great about that is that it doesn't it means you don't get that much motion sick, motion sickness because for some reason, when you're surrounded in a cockpit and you can see like a static dash with the environment moving outside, your brain is for some reason okay with that. And it's so weird that this is how it works. But yeah, you get significantly less motion sickness when you're doing that. So um, yeah, it's a really, it really works for me personally, for sure. So yeah, I haven't actually booted up um, Gran Turismo yet, but that's the like top of my list. You got to. Um, I'm super excited for it. I mean, I was like looking at Danny O'Dwyer's tweets. The I was day. just like, about to say. Danny's yeah, tweet. it heightens the game. I didn't care about it after same. it released. Yep. Yeah, I had the yep. same thing where I play. I got it last year, booted up, and I was like, all right, Gran Turismo is still not my thing. And then playing it in VR, I've I've been like, all right, I it might become fully my thing because I've been doing race <laughs> after race. I got so into it that my roommate Michael Hyam, he has a um, a steering wheel um, that you can hook up and play Gran Turismo with. And so I texted him. I was like, hey, can I borrow this? I bring it into my room. It's been sitting in our living room for like a year, just dusty. <laughs> so I, I take yeah. it, I bring it in my room, I like hook it up and I do all this stuff. And I st- I start the race and I'm in VR and I'm like, all right, let's go. It's counting down three, two, one. And as soon as it hits one, the wheel just fucking like it veers all the way left because the calibration was off and I couldn't like fix it. And so <laughs> the race starts and like my driver goes like this, right? For audio <laughs> listeners, right? Views left and then like the car goes left. And in VR, I was, it was startling. I was like, oh shit. Like it, it felt, <laughs> it felt like I was driving a real car and I'm about to like drive into a wall and do an accident because like I just wasn't ready for that to happen. That's how mm-hmm. immersive it is in, in VR. You feel like I, very few games I would actually say this for. Gran Turismo is one where I'll say, you feel like you're actually there. Like you feel like you're mm-hmm. in the car actually driving, which is more than I can say for like even a, most VR games. It also empowers uh, other modes like and I mean, it would be good for Forza as well. Uh, the like car viewer mode where you get to just like walk around the car and look at the because the developers like especially Polyphony Digital, they're so crazy about the detail and getting everything right where normally I go, that's cool. And like I click on it, I'll like spin around the car and go, cool, nice job, everybody. But experiencing it in VR, you really actually can like I was clicking on cars I know I would never see in real life. And I'm like, I want to. I want to see this up close and like walk around mm-hmm. it and like check it out. And I, I love that. Like I actually mm-hmm. was a surprise that like that was like a secondary, really powerful feature that came from it. Yeah. I mean, like full credit to Sony that that launch lineup, because essentially you've got just in, in terms of your headline items, you've got Gran Turismo, which is, well, what the best racing VR experience you can have right now. Full stop straight away. It sounds like it. Uh, no Man's Sky, which got updated for PSVR 2 and with a whole bunch of new features, which is meant to be superb. Resident Evil Village, which is also meant to be excellent and just consistent with previous um, VR ports for Resident Evil games. And you got Horizon Call of the Mountain, which is like purpose built. It's obviously like a little bit tech, dem- tech demo e, but that's four really good games <laughs> available on day one in your VR headset. And there's only like a handful of really good must play VR experiences across the entire VR landscape. Like there's not many, you know, 
Uh, and I think to, for Sony to already have that sort of stuff on there on day one, that's a really good value proposition. And Resident Evil 4 remake, they just announced that there's a VR mode coming for that. Uh, Sony announced five new games at the recent state of play. Smaller titles, obviously, but still interesting. There's that new one from the people who did uh, the Res Infinite uh, remaster and yeah. Tetris, uh, Effect. Tetris, Tetris Effect. Tetris Effect. Effect. That humanity looking game, that's got a VR mode as well. Uh, I was quite skeptical about whether or not Sony would really like go all in on this or whether they would just like kind of drop it and go, oh, well, let's just see what happens. But it seems like they're putting time and money and effort and marketing behind it. And uh, I think so far it's like a success. That's that's my that's my take on it so far. So, yeah, I, I hope so. I think for me, the only thing is like it is a lot of money. It costs more than yeah. a console. Mm-hmm. And if you only like one of those big things like if you want to just get it because you just like no man's sky and you want to like fade away into no man's sky that's cool but like if you if you're not into any of the other games it's a tougher sell but have any of you guys touched resident evil village in it oh yeah oh mamma mia (laughs) and i'm not talking about the big lady all right listen uh it it's it it makes the game better uh seven was good but here it like tones it back down whereas village is a little more intense a little more actiony uh it makes it way harder way more deliberate mm. way more stress inducing than i expected it totally caught me off guard i went into it like ah, all right what do we, i'm ethan winters you know uh it totally like stressed me out and like put the put the resident evil back in village where like village only had it in spots i didn't get mm. to the the you know oh i was gonna ask did you that get moment to- no, yeah. I didn't get to that yet. But from the beginning, even just like the early, like the first run and gun attack, like when they're all chasing you and you just have to survive until the cutscene, that was agonizing. From me scrambling to try and reload to you actually have to pour out the health potions on you and everything. Like sure. it was, I was like a, a mess. It turned me into like a flabbergasted, like blubbery idiot. And I, I that's a success. If uh, if Ethan loses a digit in game, do you lose one in real life as well in VR? Or is <laughs> you that, take off the is helmet, your fingers are. Oh no! Fuck! It has thing, some though? it has some weird stuff like that where there's a lot of things that Ethan does in the first person camera mode in game where he'll like look down at his leg and like yeah pull a knife out of it or something. And That's you know cool. if like you're leaning over a little bit or like it's not always lined up right, like they don't always have the perspective right. So sometimes it's like you're clipping through his arm or whatever but it it really was something else and i think people should definitely not uh don't write that one off that's a even even if you played mm-hmm. seven in vr and you were like all right cool like this one i was really blown away by is mm-hmm. the dlc available for you do you know because i've played resident Evil village i've not played the dlc uh is the dlc in vr yeah i think I think it's so. The rose I don't stuff? Know. Oh, the rose. Yeah. Wow, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't know, actually. I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I'd be surprised if it was. I, they haven't mentioned it. I thought they would mention that in the marketing mm. if it was, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, maybe that's a good point. Maybe out, that's right? something they would emphasize. Because yeah. the rose one came out last fall. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah recent ish. And so maybe that's something that either comes later or something where they're like, eh, it's just the DLC. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be in VR. Yeah. Because I don't think yeah. people, I think people said it was fine. As well, yeah, the DLC. I, I, I played like half an hour of it, and I was like, "Yep, this is fine." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm, Overall, I'm in a similar fun. I'm in a similar place with the um, the value proposition of VR. Mm-hmm. Like, that's probably one of my bigger hangups with it is the fact that you know, I uh, the launch lineup for uh, PlayStation VR I think does have a handful of of bangers there, right? Especially if you're somebody that if you're super into Horizon and you want you just want more Horizon and you're down to climb. Yeah, Horizon Call on the Mountain is there for you. And then things like Village and then things like uh, Gran Turismo 7, I think, help bolster it as well. But the the future of VR, like how much I'm, how much am I going to come back and use my PSVR 2 is the main thing I worry about when I look down the line of um, what games are announced uh, over the year. Also, what games are here that weren't on PlayStation VR 1? You know, like there's a lot of ports happening, right? Like in, when you talk about the um there a couple things right there's the the playstation blog um uh where they've been promoting like hey we have 40 vr2 titles right like come here you got 40 in the in the launch window so in the first about month or so there's 40 vr titles a large chunk of those a very large chunk of those are games that are either that were on psvr1 or games that 
have been on MetaQuest games that are ports, games that have that are maybe a year old in the case of even th- something like Village or Gran Turismo, right? Where do you want to come back to this? I, I These are questions that the audience, I, I, I think, will have um, for themselves when they're showing up to the store to possibly possibly pick this thing up. Um, for me, there's that. And then there's also the idea of like games that aren't there, right? Like I, I would love to be like, yo, pick it up because now you can finally play Astrobot Rescue Mission. You can't you can't play Astrobot yeah. Astrobot Rescue Mission on this thing, which is a bit of a what? disappointment. Yeah. It's, Surely they it's will, not back compatible. They they've got better to update God. it. They have to. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, even Beat Saber. Beat Saber was part of their um, one of the recent. It might have been like CES or one of those uh, conferences where they showed off VR for a little bit, and they were like, "Oh, and also Beat Saber is is coming out for PSVR two sometime after launch." And it's yeah. like, wait, but that was on PSVR one. Like, why isn't it available? Yeah you know, on PSVR 2. And again, that is down to it not being backwards compatible because the tracking is different. So those games wouldn't naturally fit on PSVR 2. Um, mm. But yeah, like I wonder a lot, like is the $550 for PSVR 2 going to be worth it for the grand audience that shows up for it at the end of the day or a couple years from now is going to feel like a Vita situation where it is, all right, like where are the games? Like, are there more first party games coming out yeah. for this thing? That still worries me, but I think in terms of software, right now on day what two or three or five, uh, we're off to a we're off to a good start. You know, like yes. I, I think the software that's here on during this launch window, um, especially now that I've gotten to change to check out Gran Turismo and, and fucking love it, uh, I think they're off to a great start. Next up, uh, Destiny Two Lightfall. Congrats, congrats, Happy Destiny you, people. Ralph. Good for you, Ralph. It's a big day. What's, a, it's what's very, the deal with this? Solid. It's only been out it's, like it's, a day. Well, actually, I've taken a break from playing it so that I could be here with you fine people today. Oh, we're great. That is uh, not the message well, you left is. in Discord. <laughs> <laughs> it was more Australian no, in Discord. That is, uh, no, you, mis- <laughs> you misread, okay? That is exactly what I said in Discord. Thank you very much, Lucy. And there's no evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, I Yeah, I mean, look, it is uh, expansion for Destiny. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's an ambitious one. Um, it adds an entirely new kind of subclass to the game. Uh, it sits it in a new location. It adds a whole bunch of quality of life features. Uh, it is the penultimate expansion in the 10-year saga. Uh, it's sort of like the second last one that will wrap up, that that's, that moves us towards the, the big conclusion, which is going to be the final shape next year. And uh, yeah, so far so good. I've really loved what I've played. I've played a few hours of it. I'm about three or four missions deep now. I'm just getting to the part where it's getting hard and there's some real bullshit because I'm playing at the hardest difficulty and it's tricky. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people are wondering whether or not this is a good jumping in point for people. And I can't really say yes or no to that yet, but my general vibe is probably not because again, this is towards the back end of a saga. Uh, they actually have also just increased the base difficulty of the game as well to make it a little bit more tricky, not unreasonably so. Um, but like just to bring it up a level because the game got a little bit too easy recently. Um, yeah, it's just, it, and also they haven't touched the new player experience, broadly speaking, which is very confusing and unwelcoming. So, great. Uh, I say so again, yeah, Lucy great. has downloaded it. So has <laughs> so has Jake, our editor. Oh. Uh, look, of course, you can push through all this stuff. Don't get me wrong; it's not like it's impossible. But what I'm saying is yeah. that some games, it's really easy just to fall into them and off yeah. you go. The Destiny's a lot like that. It's 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 some work to really, you know, yeah. Uh, I've queued up. Uh- a my name is Biff Bife. Uh, law my name video- is Biff. Yes, Biff, I, I've queued it's up. My, one name of- my name is Bife. Is my name is Bife. I thought so. He's a friend. Yes. He's lovely. I met him in he like is. 2016, and I haven't seen him since. But he was very yep, nice. Yep, I yep. Um, yep. I've queued up his video, which is Destiny Two lore in 45 minutes. Yes. Um, and I, I mean, do you? Just- do you know that me, Tam, and Dave at work had a Destiny 2 show for a while? No. <laughs> what? what the fuck? Called Destiny's Children. Guess who got to name it? Oh, uh, that's wow. Which, who, which one was Beyonce? <laughs> Tam. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, oh, shit. I was Michelle. Wait, did you actually play the game back then? Yeah. Oh, you did? So no we way. got, like, raid ready. All we did for Whoa. a week after that game launched was just play it and get raid ready. And then I don't even think we did the raid. <laughs> That's about as far as I, mean, I got. I mean, to be fair, one week to get ready for raid back with it, back then would have been Oh, it was miserable. I'm not going to yeah, lie. It, it was, like, yeah, all day, every day. All we would do is play Destiny. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this then, sounds terrible. Oh, sounds yeah, awful. who would do that? <laughs> but it's always been, and you know, obviously being friends with you and seeing on the on the old TL people just talking about Destiny, I've, I've always had yeah. a sense of FOMO. But my my, I will play it and I will report back. Um, sure. I will help you. I can I can you. carry you through yeah. things. I can explain things in a, you know, right try trigger, to not be. Right trigger, shoot, <laughs> go here. <laughs> Which, that's right, exactly. I have a question. Uh, Whatever yeah. happened to that cool robot? There was like the one who was cool. He was like Cade? a Nathan Fillion robot. Kate Six? Cade. He was uh, Nathan look, Fillion, I don't want to tell he? you what happened to him. Oh, it's, man. Let me tell you about an uh, expansion that came out. Even that, I know what happened to Cade. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, I, there were like Cade, um, what's the word for it? Like stands? Like the people oh, that yeah. like would, would like simp over Cade that, yeah. I fo- that I followed. Close friends that loved Cade. Shout out to sure. uh, Chloe, Echo Chloe. Um, mm-hmm. When they did what they did to Cade Six, I've never seen a person just <laughs> break. <laughs> like, you know what's really funny though? In this expansion, they've added a memorial to him in the tower. Like, it's just this up. statue that's sitting off to the side now, and you can go up and like press a button, and and one of the like vanguard or whatever will give a little quote, being like, "I really miss Cade." <laughs> you know? Spoiler alert: He's dead, Jake. Sorry, that's Jake. the point of this story. <laughs> I, there's Cade's only like died. he's dead. Cade is dead. He's gone. I okay. feel like he's the only like this is my head cannon, but it's like he's the only robot in the whole Destiny world that had sex. Like he just gives <laughs> off that vibe. Cade, uh, you don't yes, think Peter Dinklage's robot did? You don't think <laughs> that, that little? You think that little? Bot? Yeah, you don't think Dinklebot was getting it on? Some, Not with a, some, <laughs> know the name like Dinklebot. <laughs> right. Wait, who replaced Dinklebot? Was it? Uh, Noel North. Nolan North. Okay. We ended up calling him Noel Android. Uh, he does a perfectly fine job. He, uh, better than Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage was really just that like came from he was there for a paycheck. You know what I mean? And so uh, it was nice. It's nice nostalgia to remember him, but Nolan is definitely doing better work. Yeah. And the, the roster of characters is definitely filled out because back then it was kind of just the Cage show almost, but now there's actually quite a few notable okay. characters. The is Zavala is still better. doing his thing? He was cool. Yeah, he's still like the leader. Cool. And he's still rocking it. And, um, you know, Lance is on, on, on like Twitter flirting with us and delivering us Zavala lines. That's great. Um, so, yeah. So, look, it's, uh, it's a really interesting time. And as well, I can, I'm very excited to say next episode we are going to be joined by none other than Joe Blackburn who is the lead of Destiny 2. He's the, he's the boss man. Uh, and he is joining the podcast to talk about the launch of Lightfall and, you know, highs and lows and the day one raid experience and how that's gone and the acquisition from Sony, because obviously they are now a Bungie studio. And uh, his thoughts on live service delivery, very relevant given what we just talked about mm. with Suicide Squad and just random stuff. It's not going to be a too down in the weeds Destiny discussion because we know a lot of people who listen to this podcast don't play Destiny. But, you know, he is leading one of the most successful live service games in the world and his studio has recently been acquired by Sony and he's had a career in game dev, extraordinarily successful. So, I just a really interesting guy to talk to in general. I can ask him about if Cade had sex. <laughs> we can ask him about that. <laughs> Cade had sex. Jake wants to know, did Cade <laughs> had, did he have the sex? You haven't? <laughs> Joe will be like, this question wasn't on the approved questions list. <laughs> like, well, there was no approved no. questions list, firstly. <laughs> He'll tell you about the cut con- content where, like, later on in that same expansion where Kate died, there's a, a lady that appears that is pregnant with Kate's baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, my right. God. The rule 34 of Kate. Yes, that's got to be a lot. So, yeah, All that's right. why that's uh, that's life Yeah. Well, moving on, uh, as Kate the sex. time of this, Sorry, uh, you guys <laughs> listening to this, the review should be dropping for Wolong Fallen Destiny. Uh, Fallen Dynasty. Destiny. <laughs> Fallen Dynasty. Sorry. <laughs> Whoop, got Destiny on the brain. Look at me. Uh, yeah. Wolong Fallen Dynasty. Uh, it's the latest Souls like RPG game from the folks behind Neo and Neo 2. And uh, I have put a handful of hours into it. Blessing, you said you're almost finished with it. I am very close to finishing it. I, I'm about 29 hours in. So how are you feeling? Yeah. I really like this game. Um, you know, you mentioned it's from the same folks as Neo and Neo 2. Don't forget Stranger of Paradise, Final Fantasy Origin. They're most one of their most notable works. Um, <laughs> no, funny enough, that Stranger of Paradise is actually where I came in with um, like this era of Team Ninja. I missed out on the, the Neo games, but... The idea of a more actiony Final Fantasy game was the one that did it for me, and I played through that. And you know, 
Stranger Paradise has its flaws, but there's enough fun there where actually at, at the end of the day, I, I enjoyed my time with that game. Um, and I saw the trailer for Wolong. I was like, this looks cool. Played the demo for Wolong back uh, when that dropped in the last fall and really, really enjoyed the demo. There was a hard boss fight. There was a hard boss fight during that demo that um, really he's helped display. He's still fucking there. And he's still there. <laughs> um, but he's, weirdly enough, he's in a different location. Um, but like, you know, there was a boss fight uh, that really helps illustrate how the deflect system works, which is probably a little bit comparable to the uh, parries in Sekiro, where you are deflecting multiple hits um, at a time to hopefully hit back and then uh, bring up the opponent's stagger meter to then stagger them and then get a critical hit on them. Um, it's that kind of action game. And I've been having a, a, a great time with it. Um, after I played the demo, I booted up Neo 2 actually to try and um, um, get some time with that because people said that, hey, if you like the Wolong demo, you'll like Neo. Start mm -hmm. playing Neo 2. Neo 2 ended up being too hard for me. I and this is like one of the few times where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't know if I have the stuff. A lot. I can, it's I consider myself a gamer, but Neo Two might have just defeated me. Um, it, Neo Two's got a lot of bullshit in it. Like, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not even, it's not good difficulty. I don't think it's got just a lot of annoying trash mobs who will one shot you if you fuck up and. And then you're just like, oh, I've cleared all this trash. I got to clear it again. Yeah. And There's also the, the, the key pull system in that game also kind of fucked me up a little bit. I, I I love that system. I just couldn't like my brain. I just couldn't wrap my brain around the key pull right, system. Right. You know, like it's a, it's more of a me thing than uh, sure. the game thing. But yeah, yeah right. like I, I played a bit of that. And after a little bit, I, I fell off of it. And I was like, you know what? I'll just play Wolong when that comes through. And Again, I'm about 20 hour, 29 hours into it. I'm not that far away from beating it as of the time we're recording. Hopefully, I'll have it beat as of the time you're listening to this. Uh, and that game is great. You know, it's not perfect. Um, there's a short list of things that I could see improvement on um, with this game. I think <clears throat> visually, it's not it, it, it's not my favorite. It's a little bit busy uh, in yeah. some places. Um, in like a lot of the environment, the visual design of the environment and the um, like the character design there. I don't know how to I don't know how to put it. There's something about it that just strikes me as a bit like both almost overly polished and then also flat. Spicy. Yeah. Yeah. It, like it's it, it, it's it lands a little bit flat for me. Um, but there are cut scenes where you you have like action moments and action choreography where I'm like, no, this has the stuff. But yeah, overall, like that aspect of the game doesn't come all the way to, to, together for me. And then things like story, I found a bit forgettable. Um, uh, but then, like, outside of that, and things like soundtrack also, I found a little bit forgettable. But outside of that stuff, the gameplay hits so well for me, um, especially in the combat. I think the game is just super fun to play. It it seems a bit easier than Neo, but still on the harder side, right? Like, it's way more difficult than something like Stranger of Paradise. Um, the boss battles and the boss design I find very fun. And the deflect system... I think just works so well. I love the 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 stagger system. I love how that stuff builds. Um, the weapon system, like acquiring all the different weapons, upgrading the loot, doing all that stuff is very satisfying. Although there is an overabundance of loot, of loot. and I had that same thing with yeah. Stranger Paradise, and I think Neo probably suffers from the same thing as well. But there's a lot of loot in this game. But I do I do enjoy the process of mm -hmm. picking out what weapons are going to work for me. I've been rocking the dual swords, and those have been really fun to 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 mess with. Um, there's an interesting system in this game where you, uh, there's a, it's like a flag system where you are essentially mm -hmm. at every checkpoint, you have like a battle flag that you'll mark down and that's how you kind of mark your territory and also, you know, uh, fill in the checkpoints. But then there's also these, uh, marking flags that do the same thing where once you mark a spot, uh, that'll then up your overall like morale for your crew, which then makes it so that the area become the level that you're on becomes a little bit easier. Like you're not taking as much damage from enemies. And so level to level, the more you explore a level, the more powerful you become in that level, which I find interesting because you start a level and you're kind of weak and then you get further in. And by the time you get to the end of the level, you're all the way powered up. If you've done the exploring and it's mm -hmm. like, cool, I can take on anything now, which is a bit different, but I also like it. You know, I think it's a bit, a bit of a refreshing take for, this type of souls game or souls like game right i'll just say action game um but yeah like i've been having a blast with it i've been yeah. enjoying it but like i am that first boss like the first proper boss is such a skill check oh yeah to the point oh, where it's yeah. frustrating and i just like 
I keep coming away and then having a crack at him and like I can get phase one perfectly at this point because I think the deflect system is way more forgiving than in a souls game I think it's you know and especially because when they do these I think it's a critical strike or the you know the flash red you don't have to worry like in Sekiro about jumping or anything or doing anything like that it's just a, you can just do the deflect and it's fine and so I'm getting used to that but also that guy is I hate him I hate him so much <laughs> there's a bit of uneven difficulty I think in the game too yeah. where yeah the first it's, boss is difficult there is a job. there is a boss halfway through that might I'll probably end up being the, one of the most difficult bosses of the year I uh, I spent like three to three and a half hours on this guy and this is a game where for the most part I'm not really dying that much you know like I again Wolong more difficult than Stranger of Paradise but not as difficult as Neo 2 so I'm hitting bosses and I'm like maybe dying once or twice but by the third time for most of these bosses I'm I'm getting them down there's a boss halfway through where legitimately I was like what what is going on here <laughs> like am I crazy like and I like hit up other people and like, they're like no that dude is hard like we don't know why there's a crazy difficulty spike um just halfway through the game that then goes down afterwards but yeah there's a bit of unevenness in the difficulty I'd say yeah I think yeah, like I overall am... it's just like a little it's not as I, I guess we're just so attuned to and it feels so funny saying this because from games like when they come out there's always something in them that's kind of like broken but then you kind of learn to love it and you kind of expect it and so seeing something like Wolong come out and then obviously it's going to be compared so much to Souls games like one of the producers of Bloodborne is on it like it feels weird to have these massive massive swings because even like Genichiro was that skill check but he didn't feel unfair he didn't feel mm. like a big swing in a different direction, but well, especially because I trapped him behind a door and killed him that way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I I'm I'm happy because I sometimes I have to like drag myself into these games, like Souls like games. They don't come natural to me. I'm very bad at them. I like <clears throat> I like diving into them and like learning why people like them or why this specific one works. Elden Ring did click with me. Uh, but this one, I was like, oh, I can't. I don't want to do another one. Like, I like, I just, I don't seek these games out. I don't like getting my ass beat like that. Like, that's just not my idea of a good time. Uh, but it hooked me pretty quickly. Uh, it was really, it was the challenge of the first boss, but getting it. And then from there, I was off to the races. And I was like, ooh, I like this. Uh, it rewards people who, if you're more of a dodge person, if you're quick to always hit dodge out of the way, it, it's good for that because circle button is essentially the the parry type move uh, and it's really satisfying. It is definitely it feels like they were like, OK, we made a Dark Souls. Now let's make like a kind of Sekiro. And mm -hmm. now I'm like, OK, well, I wonder what their Elden Ring is going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, yeah, the, the circle is parry, but also dodge at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like I've not really almost seen them useless. attack. Like, yeah. The like, the, oh, my so God. Yeah. Ugh. The dodge, but it also has saved me on accident a lot where <laughs> I like, you know, you get, you get into the fights and like once you're in, in, in the thick of a fight, sometimes you lose track of, oh man, okay, this person's winding up their move and like you press, you press a little bit too early and I'm like, oh shit. And then you just start tapping it and hoping that you hit it at the right time. And when you yeah. double tap circle, you then do like a dodge, a full dodge move. And that's gotten me out of trouble a couple of times. Never on purpose. <laughs> Always on accident, <laughs> but I'll take it. it. That's fine. You just say you meant to do it. I meant to do and, it, 100%. And you're lucky with it. I don't think you have any, like, iframes with it, at least as, as far as I can tell. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. I think you get smacked. Regardless. It's cool, though. You do a cool little round off spinny kick if your equipment level, level is down, which you mentioned the choreography, and it's mm -hmm. from the different weapon types all having like a really vast, cool pool of animation to the cutscenes. Like it's just like cool martial arts weaponry stuff. Like you could tell they really paid attention. When I switched from one sword type to another, I thought it oh, was yeah. just another sword. And then they're doing all these crazy different maneuvers. And I'm like, oh, that's like a crouching tiger hidden dragon sword. Cool. Yeah. When you switch to like a spear, it. there's that it's almost like your character is dancing where the way they'll yeah. like twirl it and try to hit it and all that stuff like yeah i i really enjoy it it feels intuitive it's not like as i'm fighting i'm getting lost it takes a little bit of getting used to if you've not yeah. played the other team ninja games but it you know it works i i'd say it works pretty naturally and i've enjoyed i've i'm i've pretty much stuck to the dual swords for the most for most of my playthrough but 
every now and then I'll check out a spear. I'll check. I just like checked out the um, a big hammer weapon that I got just to see, and I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. Like I actually do like some of the choreography here, and then I switch back to, to the dual swords because that's my bread and butter. Yeah, it's impressive stuff. I think uh, I think people are going to be happy with it. Yeah. Next up. Uh, some other like kind of random things you guys have been playing. I want to hear about Final Fantasy 16. Ralph, I'm yes. so fucking envious. Oh <laughs> yeah, my man. god! I got to check this out. Yes, to be honest, I like had to pinch myself when I got the invite. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Um, so yeah, look, but, uh, there's a video up on my channel if you're at all interested in the detail. But yes, I uh, went to Japan. I visited Square Enix HQ. Uh, I was there with most of the senior development team for Final Fantasy 16, including Yoshi P, who leads Creative Business Unit 3, the studio making it, as well as Yoshi P, who does localization, uh, Takai-san, who is the director, and uh, Suzuki-san, who is the combat guy, and he also was doing, he did Devil May Cry 5's combat, for example, and he, like, used to work as far back as, like, he's been with Capcom for 25 years, he worked on uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and Dragon's Dogma and whatever. So, like, Jesus yeah, obviously Christ. very... Yeah, I know, oh like, God. totally. But then they, they told this story. This is something I didn't mention in the video, actually, because there was so much content. I just didn't have time to put it all in. But basically, at the very start of the project, um, uh, Yoshi P is like, okay, this is an action game. And they created a vertical slice of a sequence where they're kind of running through a... Ca- it's basically what we play, which is running through a castle and fighting some bosses, right? They created this vertical slice, but it wasn't actually real in, in the sense that it was kind of all hard, hard baked. It was a vision of what it would look like rather than being truly playable. And then that was just to get a green light from the from the executives. They got that green light and they said, OK, cool, we're going to make an action game for Final Fantasy 16. Do we have anyone in the studio who can who can do this, who can make an action game? They looked around. They're like, no, we don't have anyone who can make a proper action game. So that's when they started looking around and they knew um, someone, actually Takai, the director, knew Suzuki and he knew that he was at a point in his career where he was kind of thinking about what was next um, and thinking about, and Suzuki was saying, oh, I was wondering, you know, would anyone outside of Square Enix have use of my skills? Um, And then Takai said to uh, Yoshi P, he's like, you have to hire this man. There is no one better we can get for this (laughs) than this man. And then uh, Yoshi P got straight on a plane, went to Osaka. Offered him like a bucket of money and said, <laughs> you will work on Final Fantasy 16. This is how much I can pay you. Do you want the job? And Suzuki said, yes, I want the job. And that was it. That's how he got it. Right. That's so awesome. they Hell they yeah. um, they basically knew that they didn't have anyone at Square Enix that could pull this off and they hired in specifically for it. Um, but yeah, it is an action game. It does feel like Devil May Cry-ish. Certainly feels more Devil May Cry than it does God of War. Right. It's faster, more like more aerial um, How does it compare to 15? Because 15, they kind oh, of went a little more sh- Kingdom Heartsy <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah, 15 yeah. fucking sucked. Oh, look, I ended up, I ended up actually liking 15 in inverted commas. Yeah. Uh, because of the boy band, it was just the yeah. bros the hanging sweet out. Boys. It was sick. Yeah. And then, and then also when you play the DLC, which wasn't available in the game at the start, and you play those DLC stories. That story hits so hard because you realize what each of those dudes sacrificed for Noctis. And it's just like, oh, it's so good. Like, it's actually excellent. And that is the only reason that I ended up liking that game. But the base game was utter garbage. <laughs> um, and the combat is terrible and, and whatever else. So it's nothing like that, TLDR. Like, th- that, that, was, that was a real-time combat model. But it felt like, it felt like if you were trying to take... What do you call? Oh, I don't even know how to just probably describe it. It was just weird. You, you basically kind of threw your sword at places to teleport, and you'd hit them a few times, yeah. and you could cast some spells, and like it just was kind of very awkward, and it was a bit nuff nuff, and was neither here nor there. This is very clearly planting a flag in that kind of character action camp, right? This is it feels in that space. It's not quite that. There is there are some differences. It's definitely more accessible, um, but that's sort of where it's going. And you already can just mix and match different abilities to create these sick looking combos and knocking foes up in the air and doing these. Oh, it's it's fun. It's definitely fun. Uh, it's going to be, I think, confronting for quite a few fans of Final Fantasy because it's so different. But um, look, Final Fantasy's often changed it up. You know, seven like they had turn based for a long time. 
ATB with uh, Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, they had, you know, like this kind of like MMO hybrid sort of feel in combat with 12. Uh, and then 15 was different again. You know, 7 Remake was this fantastic hybrid of like yeah. ATB and, and turn-based and party. They've, they've always tried to mix it up. And this is just another attempt at that. And um, I think it's, 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 it's working. I, I definitely walk away from it confident that the combat is going to work. I do not believe that everyone will like it. But I'm very confident that it will work and that many people will actually like it. So, um, yeah, outside of that story, it sounds super sick. I'm really down for it. It's much more adult and kind of gritty and political and whatever. Very keen for that. Um, the voice talent all sounded great. And the visually, it looked fantastic, even though there was a lot of motion blur. I was playing the 4K like fidelity mode. There will be a performance mode at launch. A uh, lot of motion blur. I would never in a million years play any game with that much motion blur, but uh, I'm looking forward to that performance mode. Um, and yeah, and the other major thing that came out of that when the interview was that like y- Yoshi P really hates the term JRPG. Like he's just not oh. down for it. Yeah, geez, um, interesting. So yeah, right. basically I kind of mentioned, oh, hey, you know, do you feel as though JRPGs haven't evolved over the years? Is that why you're mixing things up so much? And he's like, all right, listen, first of all, he was very nice, by the way. Like, I could tell he was kind of like, I can tell he was, didn't really love the phrasing of the question, but he wasn't like being annoyed or whatever. He was like, okay, listen, just so you know, when we make games, we make RPGs. We don't try to make JRPGs. We try to make RPGs. Interesting. Right? And, um, and I was, and I was really intrigued by that. And so I kind of probed a little further and he was like, you know, 15 years ago when the term JRPG was being thrown around, it was for Japan- many Japanese developers, a negative term. It was like they were being made fun of for making those types of games and that they felt pigeonholed by, by Western media applying this terminology in what he felt was a sort of yeah, critical way. And that's why he doesn't really like that phrase. And he says it, it sort of it pushes him into a box mm. that he doesn't really feel comfortable with. Uh, and I think that's very evident with the way that he makes games. In, in, Final Fantasy XIV is a very different type of MMO, right? And sixteen is a different type of mainline game. Uh, he likes to operate outside of the box, and so you could see why that label JRPG doesn't really um, work for him. And, and funnily enough, it's, there's a lot of discourse around that now about whether or not that it's right to think that or whether or not people agree that the term was being used in a derogatory fashion or whether he's being sensitive or not. I, I've never used the term JRPG in a, like I, I've looked at certain aspects of JRPG games and thought, okay, that part is not for me, but I've never thought, I've never used that label and thought, well, it's a JRPG, therefore it is shit. Like I've never yeah, no. used them analogously like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, that's really um, interesting because I've I I think talking about video game genre oftentimes can be fascinating when you dig into it because yes. you know I look at something like JRPG versus action RPG versus Western RPG and oftentimes especially now where a lot of video games have video game genre has evolved and has become a little bit more homogenous it like the shoe doesn't fit a lot of time like I wouldn't look at Final Fantasy 16 especially with how action heavy it is and call it um a jrpg even though final fantasy is a franchise we look at it as a jrpg franchise right it's like yeah, we look at it yeah. as possibly the jrpg franchise um yes. and but like you look at how it's evolved in gameplay and now like when you talk about it and when i've heard when, when i've read previews talking about final fantasy 16 it sounds more of like a character action game with rpg elements and it's like what does that even mean well nothing at the end I of the day mean, right <laughs> yeah i think i when i think of jrpg i think of something that has a very ambitious uh, kind of epic storyline that usually involves quite a large ensemble cast Mm. uh, that usually involves uh, like a progression system where characters are leveling up and often quite convoluted uh, leveling systems or or progression systems with lots of different menus going on and you kind of have to decipher them all. Um, But it's just, I think more than anything else, it's that sort of tone or it's that Mm. vibe where like i think is best exemplified by xenoblade chronicles these days which is i think kind of the quintessential modern jrpg and it's that you know and it's like how close or far are you from what xenoblade is today that is a jrpg in my head if you know what i mean see i was about about Um, to say before you before you talked about like tone i was gonna say it sounds like you're describing the witcher 
which is like a Western RPG. Sure, right? that's that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. it's it's those things. But then I think that the thing that really seals it is that that tone or that vibe or that mm. feel where it's JRPG. You know what I mean? And I and again, I've never viewed that as an inherently negative thing, even though I'm not as close to JRPGs as I was back in the PS1 and PS2 era. You know, now I'm I play far fewer of them. But back then they were a much more potent force in video games, I think. And I actually kind of feel the opposite to how he feels in the sense that he talks about like oh 15 years ago it was being used as a disparaging term and i'm like well i don't know man i don't i never i never 15 I never, yeah, no. 15 well, years ago where were we we, we, we were like ps2 era were we PS2 yeah era? Where you're talking about like mm-hmm. tales of symphonia and like final fantasy mm-hmm. like 10 i mean final fantasy 10 was extraordinary i mean yeah. that was like uh, if any i still to this day say if anyone wants to get into the final fantasy series you should start with 10 you know, for a variety of reasons, which a lot of people wow. disagree with. You say that? Yeah. I knew I liked yeah. you. I like. Yeah. I didn't think you <laughs> more people would say that. That's not, great. Not, not because I think it's the best one per se, yeah. but because I feel like it hits this this intersection of like story, visuals, approachability, um, and I think it's moments and whatever else. Like, it's just a really great way to enter the franchise and not feel like scared off by it, if you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, like that period where he describes it as being this derogatory term i kind of feel the opposite and i feel and i feel like back then jrpgs were still riding high in a way that i think they have fallen off since then yeah. for sure i, I agree with that I'm so, so yeah i'm really um, excited thank I'm you very the, excited. Preview, the preview cycle worked it worked ah, i'm hyped yep. it's like i i just always show up for final fantasy mainline games but after hearing it described more and hearing more about the combat i am like this one seems like it's for me so yeah. Yep. Yes. It's, also, it's also very nice that like Ben Starr, who plays Clive, is a fan of the show. <laughs> yes, so, uh, Ben, if you're glad, listening, glad we, you uh, liked it. We are going to have you. He's the voice of Clive. Yep, he's he's Ben. We are going to have you on the podcast, man. Yeah. I hope you know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a we'll, do, we'll, get, we'll do we'll do a play along, right? That's what we'll do, right? <laughs> and uh, you can voice Clive while we're playing, and that'd be sick. <sighs> that'd so be good. that'd be perfect. So, I, but great job in the voice acting, Clive. By the way, very much enjoyed your performance. All the voice actors were super strong. Did you hear? So I didn't know this until today. Dom Pepiot, I can't remember where they wrote it up for, but um, there are Geordies in it. And like, that's from my neck of the woods. And I was so stoked to hear that because (laughs) like in the UK, which which (laughs) is very well, is just having different people in, um, in, in the Witcher, like coming from different regions, like the Baron is, is a Brummian, for example. And then I would just really like that, you know, as they're taking sort of old fantasy, like medieval kind of stuff as an inspiration, it's just really nice to be like, yeah, there are Geordies. In- <sighs> I mean, I wouldn't say it's because of uh, they're taking old medieval as inspiration. Oh, they're just taking like uh, the fact that different regions have different. Well, like, yes and no. But what I, what I mean is that if you like, I just think they work with a gr- a troupe of voice actors, the same yeah. voice actors who did Final Fantasy fourteen, and they happen to be based in that part of the world. And they do a fantastic job like this. You should play Final Fantasy. If, you like, if you're digging these accents, you should play Final Fantasy XIV and Xenoblade because it's all about these like Fucking different um, British okay. accents. No, no, no. Thingy yeah. as well. Um, what was the Ghibli game with level five? Oh, with, oh with I the can't little, believe I Nino Kuni. Nino Kuni. Kuni. They yes, did a yes. really great job of having like, yeah. the, uh, what was his name? The little, the little guy. But he had a really good like Welsh accent and they localized right, really right, well right. for that. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's that troop of people doing the same. I think it's the same troop because I heard some familiar voices, uh, and they're a really talented outfit in terms of the collection of voice actors and whatever. And uh, yeah, so so I liked it a lot. I thought it was really cool. Very cool. Not a single Long Island accent in a video game ever. <laughs> yeah, like a bunch of just I mean, very sultry uh, British voices, and then hey, I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they need to they need to do that we yeah, need they, yeah represent me damn it yeah. <laughs> uh let's talk about hitman freelancer lucy you wrote this down you've, you've been spending some time in the updated hitman new I mode what i what a great- i love oh, this game so but i don't know good. anything about freelancer i have no idea what it is i want to first off start by apologizing because my mic has been like auto adjusting and i can't make it stop so jake oh, who's editing this that. i'm yeah. sorry so editor, man. sorry <laughs> um so hitman freelancer is an update to it's not called hitman one two three anymore it's called hitman world of assassination they have always worldwide well mr worldwide 
That's right. Actually, I mean, I'm amazed there isn't some kind of pit bull tie-in. <laughs> <laughs> He's bald. Yes, yeah, I mean, makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where basically they've just taken all three games, you launch them from one kind of unified thing, and now there's a new mode called Freelancer, where instead of just like booting up Berlin or Miami or Sapiens or anything, and just going for you know, you know who the target is ahead of time, you basically have to go around the world to a couple different maps. Take out some targets um, because the syndicate is being is uh, keeping keeping a lid on who the real evil people are because more and more people are being evil. And then by doing that, you kind of figure out your ultimate target, and then you kind of go and that is the big one. So you do like a couple little missions, and then um, you build up to a big uh, a big takeout, like a big not score. That's the drug thing. Assassination. Yeah, assassination. <laughs> So is it Big random? Song. Yeah. And so like you'll oh, get like shit. little bits of information where you know they'll have oh it ha they have um like brown hair, a tattoo and glasses. Ooh. But then you walk around and there'll be a bunch of people like that and you have to like figure out make sure That's all the cool. configuration is correct. Um but when you start the game, the very beginning of freelancer you don't really have anything. Um I booted it up and it was like okay, well you have a gun. That's it. And then if what if you go away, you do one of the missions, come back to like your base, you get Diana gives you like one of three things that you can pick from to take into the next place. And then you kind of build I see what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you can also like take things home from the missions where yeah. like if you find a gun, if you if you make it out of the mission with the gun on you, then like you can kind of keep the gun if you put it on the thing. But then if you take that gun back out and you lose the gun, then you lost the gun. Would you so call persistent this, like, items? Rogue, rogue elements? Rogue oh, yeah. Light, yeah. Rogue, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah so I would describe yeah, it fully a, as a roguelite mode. Sweet. Oh, like, my God. I remember, mm. what was it, 2016 when Hitman in this iteration came out and everyone just fucking hated the fact that it was episodic, hated the release, I yeah, hated the way that right. they were it's doing confusing. it. And it is wild to see it now because it is it is one of the greatest of all time, I think. It is I, I agree. unbelievably good. Like the way they've handled. Wait, do you remember when they did the Sean Bean thing? That is so fucking clever. Like oh, the guy yeah. who the guy who I don't dies. Know, I don't know this. So Sean Bean, uh, like the actor, famous sure. for dying and everything. They put him <laughs> in as um, one of the targets in a limited time Hitman thing, and no his way. character was called the Unkillable or something uh, like that. And they made a whole joke about it, and it was actually him, and you had to kill him, and it was that is so cool. I think you only got like one run at him. Was that right? Like, and if you biffed it, For, oh, yeah, you as an elusive, biffed, elusive target. That's that one, it. yeah, how the elusive targets work. Where, yeah, yeah, every like month or so, I feel like they would add add a new elusive, yeah. elusive target to one of the levels randomly, and yeah, you would have to go in and you get one shot to kill this target who's yeah. in the map. And that's why I like freelancer mode. Is freelancer I think carries a lot of the spirit of elusive <laughs> targets because it is if you fail, like there are certain missions where if you fail, you fail the whole thing. But I think overall, as you're going, if you fail twice uh, in like a like a run, like in a stack, then you fail the whole thing. Um, and yeah, like you go in and it's ra randomized, right? And that's what it, it, Hitman I put up there is one of the ghosts because they had to design these levels so meticulously where yeah. you have so many NPCs and so much space to work. Like they're like these small open worlds, basically each of these levels. There's like almost 20 of them. And you go in and you have all these NPCs that all have their own routines that like a lot of them are voice or um, voiced and have like these back and forths and have these things where if you follow these NPCs, you're getting an idea of the workday. Um, but yeah, like I had one target where I go in, um, uh, I start the level and I quickly learn that, okay, the person I'm going after in this level is a bellhop. All right, let me follow. And they want me to kill the bellhop with a, with a very specific gun. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, let me follow his routine. And this bellhop goes from, you know, being at the front desk with a lot of people around to then going and walking outside with a lot of people around to then going and then serving a guest and then going back to the front desk. And then he does that routine over the course of a few minutes. And I'm like, there's no place where I can get this person private to where I can kill them and then also escape, you know, because that's the thing about Hitman is that you had to also make it out of the mission. And after a while, I'm like tailing this guy, studying his every, his every move, being like, all right, how am I going to make my, my thing? And I realized that once he gets outside, there's only like two people that he can that will see him. One of them like kind of see sees him like from the other side of like this bush that I'm at. And this bush that I'm hiding at, there's also a guy that has a sight line of me. 
So what I decided to do is, all right, I got to take this coin. I got to throw it on like toward the other side of that person without them seeing me throw it so that they get distracted. And then I got to like take them out with the gun with the silencer and then immediately beeline and peace out so that other person doesn't see that I'm the person that shot him. And I pulled it off and it was like, so it was by like a sliver of a second to where I'm able to escape without being seen. And it's the most satisfying thing ever because I'm never going to have that same assignment again, probably. Right. I'm never going to take out the same person again. That's no. so cool. It's, it's a beautiful so, thing. I, it's also like I, the I, funniest I, game. It can, it can, I, that's, it's it's yep. so sounds hilarious. funny. So many things could go wrong just by in the way you're describing it. Yeah. It's sure. the perfect stream. I playing it on stream. Every single mission I did had some sort of comedic moment to it. You know, like uh, there was another one where during one of the big missions where I'm not trying to identify who the person is. I sneak into like this super secret base that's below um, like below the first street. And uh, I think it's like in Shanking, China. I am in like in this big, you know, test secret facility where everybody's armed and I'm like in a corner. I'm seeing all the different targets that have all the features that I'm looking for pass by and I'm analyzing them to see which one of them has all the things I'm looking for. And after a while, I'm like, I literally can't go anywhere. I'm kind of stuck in this corner with the route out like right behind me. I see them, I see, I see two of my targets or two of my potential targets take a meeting and I'm like, surely it's got to be one of these guys. Like it has to be one of them. And so I was like, all right, you know what? I'm taking out this rubber duck that also is a doubles as an explosive. It's like a proximity explosive that looks like a rubber duck. So you don't look suspicious holding it. I threw it at us. <laughs> I'm just randomly holding a rubber duck. Don't worry about that. Wrong with that, man. Just, yeah, just a normal Don't worry about this rubber, this normal rubber, a, rubber duck. I'm a man in a suit with a tie with a rubber duck. Don't, don't think about it too hard. I chuck it at them. It explodes, and neither, and neither of them is the guy. And so, like, I then had to beeline because now everybody in this facility is panicking. Now everybody's like, there's been an explosion. <laughs> and I beeline out and I'm like, um, if you so if you disrupt things too much, they might escort the targets out of the level. Um, and then you, you'll feel that le level if they make it out. And so, like, they start escorting the actual target out. And I'm like hiding behind a wall. I'm seeing what feels like a billion guards <laughs> like escort this one person out. It was like 10 people mm -hmm. escorting this one, this one person out. And I'm like. All right, now is my one shot. And so, like, they're go they they take a right out of the door. I'm on the left side behind the wall. As they all leave out, I then peek out and I aim my gun to try and get that person at a headshot. And when I tell you, I miss five shots in a row, <laughs> and everybody's like, "What the? What's going on?" And they turn around, they kill me. Legitimately, fucking hilarious as it was happening in real time. It's, a, it's such a fantastic game. That's great. Anyway, Ralph, if that's our sales pitch. Play. I mean, it's I, it's always been. Time. Yes, no. I mean, I to my great shame, I have not played Hitman, and, and it's because I'm. I also really like time loop games, mm. and people are always saying to me, like, dude, if you like time loop games, you have to play Hitman. Yep. Because the way you described it is kind of what I imagined Death Loop would end up being, and I guess one of the reasons why I was kind of bummed about Death Loop was it wasn't that thing where you had to study mm. root like people's routines and like intervene in exact moments and like I just love that idea. I think that's so cool. And um, yeah, so Hitman is is very high on my pile of shame, like one of the highest for sure. I love the series, and now I'm now I have another reason to replay them. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, next up on the list, we got something that is not a game. It's called Dice. Lucy, you were at Dice. It's kind of game. No, it's uh, yeah, I went what to is Dice, Dice, which is I honestly like kind of a networking convention thing for game devs and uh, some members of the press. And so Tam and I went and. Um, Gerard was also there. I uh, hung out with Gerard a bunch. And it was just like a really strange kind of event because it's not really like an E3 where there's any announcements or anything. It's mostly, you know, the big award ceremony. So I uh, got to go to that. Bumped into Miyazaki and sent you guys a sneaky pic because we didn't know nice. he was going to be there. And so <laughs> it was just really strange to kind of walk around because it's all in casinos uh, in one in one hotel, but it's in Vegas. Okay. And it was just like this big industry gathering. And honestly, I don't really have much to say about it because all we did was like take meetings and talk about like what, you know, Tam and I working on at GameSpot over the next uh, few months and like pitching ideas to PR and stuff um, to get some buy in, hopefully. And then just like, just, you know, I'll, I'll walk past something and I see, you know, like, Todd Howard or someone walking around, you know, it's just very, very strange to see all these people or like, you know, Tim Schafer was there and I've just walked past him in a corridor and it was just very strange, especially as like someone who 
been in the games industry a long time, but I still kind of get a little bit starstruck when you see those people. And when you see mm. when you're at the awards and stuff, and like Miyazaki just walks by you, and you're like, Ugh, I didn't even know you were here. Hello, I love you, games. That's um, like my first E3. I walked into my first E3, and within two minutes, I was in a hallway. I walked past Lil John, and I was like, Wow! Oh my god, E3 is magical. <laughs> Was he walking I, to the window or to the wall? So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Lucy, if like, so is it more? So if it's a more developer focused thing, like if you're a budding game developer, should you go to this? Mm. Is this like That's, a place yeah. to meet people and hand out a business card or your resume? And so this this is my first one, but I would say like if you have like if you're in the pitching phase or if you're like searching for funding phase. I think the networking there would be kind of invaluable. There's a lot of like biz people there too. Um, and obviously GDC is the other one, which is coming up at the end of this month, which is the Game Developers Conference. And there's an awards thing there, but there's also mm. loads of talks. And there was talks at DICE, but um, I don't think we, there was some round tables that like some of it were media friendly and some of them were kind of more, um, you know, definitely just like dev and biz focused. But in terms of like networking, it's kind of incredible who you can just kind of run into and pitch games to and whatever. So I would definitely, the problem is, and this is kind of a big thing, you know, with GDC as well is cost mm. because it does yeah. cost a lot of money to not only fly to Vegas, stay there for a few days, um, but also just to even attend. Um, how, much, how much is it to attend? I am not sure because I'm. I remember hearing something I like twelve hundred dollars a ticket or something for GDC. GDC, GDC yeah. is exceptionally expensive, and I've seen, mm. um, you know, they don't compensate um, speakers or anything, and so yeah, right, it's, okay. you know, kind of yeah, right. another one where it's like, oh, okay, you go for the prestige, but can't. Uh, I mean, and like, okay, San Francisco liver here. I personally lives in San Francisco, but like. This place is fucking expensive. Like, even at the best of times, and I can't mm, even imagine mm. how much the hotels and stuff are going to be around a convention because my mum complains when she comes to visit me off-season. She's like, why is this place so hideously expensive? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't <laughs> know. Help. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to live. I'm just trying to live, Lynn. Mm. Just trying to live. <laughs> Um, but no, it was just kind of, it was, it was cool. And like, I've always, um, just kind of, you know, it's one of those events that I've always looked at from afar and Mm. it was cool to actually go. And I said to you guys that we should all go next year. Um, cause it's just like, it's really nice. And like, or Tokyo game show this year, question mark. I just want to meet the guy who made Flappy Bird. I hope he's there. I hope he's well. <laughs> I hope he's doing okay. I didn't see him there. He, it was a stressful Damn. time for him, Flappy Bird's release. I hope he's. Uh, I hope I he's. Hope he's, hope he's thriving since then. I assume Sitting so. on his giant pile the, of money. There is a Flappy Bird. Um, so this is another thing because I'm one of those people who loves Vegas. I spend you know three days there once a year and then I leave and then I hopefully you know, <laughs> like, you know that's my max. I have a max out in Vegas. Um, but the licensed machines are so weird. And so the, the, the reason I'm bringing this around is because there is a Flappy Bird machine. We didn't see it. But we were staying in Resorts World, which is a brand new casino. I think it's only a couple years old. And we were with Andrew Goldfarb, XIGN, currently Sucker Punch. And uh, he and I and Tam are very, very big Persona fans. And there is a licensed Persona 5 slot machine. Yeah, I've heard, I've seen uh, this actually. And wow. we went to a hotel called Orleans, which I'd never even heard of. Um, kind of a very old, shabby, rundown <laughs> casino. We went all the way there to find it's. Oh, the machine is called Four Reels, by the way. Phenomenal work. We went all the <laughs> way there, and they got rid of it in the last like two weeks. Ah, uh, oh, devastated. It. Um, I can't believe so you built me up like that, that to break me down. I was yeah, so excited. I know, right? <laughs> oh, damn. I was expecting to hear like a jackpot story at the no. end. And, you know, we're like, we walked away with 25K. It was sick. No. Lost it, bet it all on black and lost. It was the only, yeah, right. it, like, I don't gamble either. Why do I like Vegas? I don't know. Um, it's <laughs> hideous. It's like Dion residency. It's that's why. It's <laughs> expensive and I don't gamble. But uh, yeah, we went all the way there to try and find it and it was gone. And it was the only time I was like, I will bet 20 of my own dollars. Uh, and I didn't. But you know, did get to go to the awards. The awards are cool. Greg and um, Stella hosted and did an incredible job. So nice. It was great. 
Cool. Shout out to Dice. Cool. Are we talking about your chair? You wrote down we your chair, We don't have too. to. I wrote that down as like a joke because oh, well, I'm, in, here we go. I'm in like a gaming <laughs> rut. Because um, I just, I don't, I, I feel like I'm kind of just kind of all over the place a little bit, like dipping into things. But I did get a new chair, which I'm very excited about because it means that I don't have a gaming chair anymore. And that I did have a secret lab and I really enjoyed it for like a year. And then I turned 30 and I couldn't <laughs> sit on it anymore. Uh, without, so like that. <laughs> without an immense so amount like of that. pain. Um, and so took advantage of some of the office furniture liquidation stuff over in San Francisco because sadly a lot of places are closing down uh, and it meant that I kind of upgraded to a nice office chair and it's it's wild the difference it makes because I was getting to the point with my gaming chair where I didn't even want to play games at the end of the day on my PC because I was so uncomfortable after being sat at my desk all day. Now, all new world, baby. I'll be Hell sitting yeah, with the best good. of them. I like that little thing it has at the back where it like, into yeah, your, yeah, like yeah. your lower back, it like pushes into it. Ralph and, stuff. and I have oh, the same so chair. Good. We do. Uh, That's it. But no, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's wild. And I don't think, not to make this like ergonomics corner or anything, <laughs> but it's something that I've just never really had to think about before. And now, I, you know, I've talked a bit about, yeah, I have repetitive strain and just, you know, as I'm getting older, the debuffs keep stacking. <laughs> stacking, that's right. The stacking debuffs. But it's also kind of like an important part of, you know, you're at the desk all day and it's kind of Im- it's important. So I I my I have like the the best most ergonomic chair that I ha- that money can buy, but then I managed to sit in in a way <laughs> that it completely <laughs> devalues all of its ergonomic property. Do. I'm like a fucking I don't know, I'm like a twi- I'm like a twisty fry in this thing, just like curled up <laughs> in all sorts of angles and I get out and my back snaps in half and I have to crawl back into my house and I'm like, "Thank God I got that chair. Imagine how much worse it would be without it." You know? <laughs> so it was a really so. great reductress um headline the other day which was woman who sits like golem for nine hours a day wonder why her back wonder why her back hurts yes i was yes, like that's so me oh, so <laughs> all right let's move on over to uh the q a the next q a question from a listener or viewer not a user, a user. i got it right this time that's right uh <laughs> is from andrew andrew <laughs> says uh hello guys my question is uh if you could make nintendo's next console what would you make? Would you go down a more powerful switch route or would you do something completely different? What features would you like to incorporate? I'll start. I like Nintendo's insistence on always having like a weird quirk or a weird spin. So I'd probably do a bunch of drugs and just come up with some weird (laughs) ass thing for it. But I will say whatever they do, I would very much like for them to keep the flexibility of the switch. I love being able to dock and go handheld i find that invaluable for me that's a big selling point of the switch it's part of the fun uh and i just i just want them to keep doing that yep they'd be i think it's impossible that they would not do that like that they would forego the whole handheld hybrid thing because the success of their business has ultimately been built on handhelds yeah you know obviously they had some successful like you know consoles as well of course but like nintendo is like this handheld business was is was is insane and so they've just managed to combine that finally in the switch as people had always suggested that they probably should and uh yeah i can't imagine them ever ever changing that i just so don't trust if, them they're weird freaks they make weird decisions sometimes it's true you're you're <laughs> right but i also wonder if they're going to become a bit more risk averse now and i i don't know like it's Stakes are a lot higher. They've had a lot more practice at this. Mm. Uh, I wonder if you can count on them to to play it a bit more safe. But um, I really wish there was just some way to have a dock that somehow powers it and makes it <laughs> so it doesn't, you know what I mean, gives it some yeah. more juice, which I know is not possible, by the way, because, you know, PCs sort of have this with, like, external GPUs that you can plug into a laptop or whatever to give that. But that is so expensive and for that se- separate dock to actually provide a meaningful power uplift to the base unit would would jack the price of this so much that there's just no way they would do it. So mm. I think you'd be looking at stuff like um, there's talk of, you know, the next switch involved um, utilizing uh, NVIDIA technology for like DLSS, for example. That's more than likely where we'll see things go. Um, yeah, I just I'm really happy. Look, personally, I don't use a switch. I use a Steam Deck, right? I only use my switch for exclusives. That probably won't change anytime in the future. 
I would just want a more powerful Switch so it doesn't feel like I'm stepping back two generations whenever I boot it up and play a game on it. You know what I mean? Uh, that's ultimately it. I reckon the Switch is kind of low-key perfect in this design. It's just make one that's stronger and just keep doing that. It's like, what else do you want from your phone? At this point, phones have just got all the things that we need. Just keep making them slightly bigger to a point and faster. That's it. You know what I mean? That's, that's yeah. Like I said, no original ideas. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, Nintendo's also positioned itself in a place where they are courting more third-party um, devs and stuff. And so I can't imagine them doing something so wacky that they would kind of put them away. Like, they, they would need to keep, to, to improve the technology, to keep at least on on par with I don't know the Nint- the Switch is kind of the worst place to play place <laughs> like most third party games I think it's fair yes. to say but yes. I can see them doing you know an improved Switch better better specs runs things nicer but I would l- I would hate for them to lose some of their creativity like what the hell was the um the cardboard stuff yes. Labo the Labo Labo yeah. Labo Labo Labo, Labo, Labo. <laughs> <laughs> like my nice, nice. I we're on the same we're on the same um <laughs> where i just feel like they are always going to have an outlet whether it's with the the switch 2 console itself they will mm. find a way to get weird with it they'll figure out something out like they'll do yep. something and i don't think that will ever go away but i think the way the market right. is maybe maybe move like they've got their groove with how switch works and how you can dock it you can take it it's so easy to get other people to play with you it's everyone has one like i don't know how you would maybe i'm just i'm just not creative enough either i can't think about how you would improve that but it's just it's just it's like it's so good like it's how do you improve like again the modern games console that sits under our tv hasn't changed ultimately in the years adaptive triggers are nice don't get me wrong but they're hardly a game changer it's just make it stronger allow it to play better looking games fix the joy cons fix the joy cons so they don't suck uh that's it you know what i mean that's that's it yeah, I'm right there with you. Like, my I love my Steam Deck so much, and it sits at my desk. And I'm trying to pull it out. Like, I love this thing. Um, yeah. And so, like, ideally, my request would be for the next Switch iteration to become stronger. But I don't even think that needs to be a Switch Two, right? Like, that could also be a Switch Pro situation. Um, you know, I was talking about this recently. It's I Nintendo's in such an interesting place because Lucy mentioned that you know third parties, third party games. The worst place you, to play those probably is the Switch. The Switch thrives. Because of what Nintendo brings to the platform, it thrives off of the first party stuff. The attachment rate for what Nintendo makes for the Switch is insane, yeah. right? You look at the Animal Crossing numbers, you look at the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe numbers, and like some of these games are almost to like 50% attachment rate. It's actually yes. insane how high these games sell. And that's the main appeal. And in a weird way, in, in the last generation, um, you know, handoff from Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and PS4 or PS four to ps5 um there is there, there's been talks about generations right generations dying like do we really need generations and all that stuff and xbox was kind of the one to be like all right yeah let's kind of smoothen out the process right and even i guess playstation was like we believe in generations but then they kept releasing like um uh, across the generation games i feel like nintendo might actually be the company best poised to go fuck generations we don't need generations you know like what you're buying switch games like pokemon scarlet and violet sold 10 uh, 10 million units in three days and was the highest selling console or the fastest selling console exclusive game within that period like they don't really need to make another switch they could keep doing what they're doing and be fine with it from a software perspective um but i just want more power i think i'm tired of with my switch is playing games and seeing like the jaggies on like the the edges of the characters that i'm playing as you know like i think the, those games could um, look better, you know. Like Nintendo brings it from the art sp- uh, on, on the art style side of things. Kirby and the Forgot uh, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. I was gonna say Kirby Forbidden West. Kirby and the Forgotten Land looks great, um, and Nintendo games art direction wise tend to look great. But I think even even with some of the best art direction, sometimes you can still tell that the fidelity is a little bit off. And so, enough power to get us over that hump, and I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I've reviewed Bayonetta recently and I'm like, it's a great game, but man, does it look like shit sometimes? Like, it's just, mm-hmm. the, especially the environments were just so bad. It's kind of like, yeah, look, you really, really need to, um, you know, we need to give this thing some more juice because it's about time. Shout out to Nintendo. If you're listening, 
you know, some free ideas for you. There. Maybe think about it. And thank you to Andrew for the question. Let's move on over to another topic, side topic. Uh, Blessing actually comes to us with a pretty special video uh, that uh, him and his team put out on Kind of Funny Games. It is called specifically, uh, We Need to Fix Black Hair in Video Games. Uh, It's a special version of The Blessing Show. Uh, We highly recommend checking it out. It's a very interesting topic. It's one that some people might think like, oh, what? that's a thing. But a lot of people are frustrated with black hairstyles in games. Any game where you create a character this is a really good video just for yeah. uh, like i'm gonna Thank repeat you. myself what i said in the discord to you dude but it's got everything like it's got developer interviews you interview regular old people uh it's got social reactions it's got history it's got context within game development it's got real social issues it covers everything and i'm almost at this point like any issue any topic i want it to be explained to me and presented to <laughs> me like this show. that's right of yeah course. thank you so, so much uh we recommend checking that out but i think where to start uh when did this topic first hit you like when when did mm. you first get hit in the face like what was the first game where you went to create a character and you were like wait a minute why oh is God. there no hair like mine <laughs> how far back are we going no like <laughs> you know it's been I, it's been a thing that i i think me but like a lot of people honestly have noticed for a very long time right like since games started to get a little bit more fidelity and you started to be able to create characters and they started to be able to see more characters i've seen a lot of people uh in the black community be like all right but like what's going on with these hairstyles and the meme of it is that in every video game cr- uh, character creation um and like all the tool sets it seems like there's always like cornrows are always one of the premier um hairstyles for black characters and it's usually like it usually boils down to only a couple of styles right it's cornrows and an afro or cornrows and like bald right like those are kind of the (laughs) options you get and it's always funny saying that because one of the jokes i make in the video is like who's this guy with cornrows that every video game developer knows um (laughs) you know like there's there uh, cornrows have been and you know are a a common hairstyle but not common enough to be one of the two or three hairstyles you see uh, for black folks in a lot in a lot of video games um and so yeah like uh, there was a tweet i put up that um at some point i'm probably going to retweet or quote tweet because i got to figure out the right context put it in but you know i, I google i uh, twitter searched myself from like about a year and a half ago i had a tweet about uh, new world because that was one that uh, that that upset me a little bit because I was making my character in that game and I hit I hit the same thing where I like I looked at the lack of hair options for black characters because when I make a when I make a character in a video game I always just try to make myself you know I just want to see myself represented and like I, I like that type of immersion I like the opportunity to just like name a character um, you know blessing and try and make them look as close to me as possible and I found that in that game you know and it's, it's been like this for a while but i think this is one that broke me where I, I booted up new world and i was like i legitimately just cannot get my hairstyle and at the time it was just like i just had short hair right like short black hair it's not anything too crazy and that was the thing that was lacking but they did have cornrows <laughs> so i tweeted out i was like <laughs> i was like what is going on here and since then i've been keeping more of an eye on it right and um there have been multiple multiple games since then like babylon's fall is such a bad offender both from the hairstyle perspective but then also even from the skin color perspective you can't get you can't get really dark at all with your skin tone in babylon's fall um Elden Ring, I don't anything in that game anymore by the way yeah you can't well <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything in babylon's fall anymore uh <laughs> but even a game like Elden Ring, right which is a super popular game it is it um my game of the year for last year that's another one where when creating my character i was like man they are they are really lacking in terms of hairstyles um and hair options for this game um and so yeah, like I once we kind of funny, we recently moved into our new studio uh during the fall. Uh and we had the idea of doing another run of the blessing show and I at that time I was like, "You know what? We have the resources. We have um a cool studio to work with. Let's finally make this episode of the blessing show." And that was like 4 or 5 months ago that I had that idea and since then I just been been working on it. God, that studio. That's so cool. Like and also like Obviously, uh, you wrote it and hosted it, but I wanted to give a shout out to Roger because yeah. his work on that, like, crazy just, editing. Is he the, do the edit? Yeah. yeah it, the yeah, motion right. graphics, too. Like, super talented. Super talented. But I think it, like, everything in that video works together so, so well. And, like, those, those little flourishes just really elevated it. And, like, was it? Not to blow smoke up your ass. 
it was super engaging. <laughs> He's like, like, no, please. You, you please, kick please, off with please, a joke please. and then you kind of like educate and like to Jake's point, you know, there's history in there, there's commentary, there's education. Mm-hmm. And I think it's presented in such a great way that I was watching it and I was like enthralled all the way through. And I was like, so when you sent the link and I was like, 17 minutes on YouTube, all right? Well, yeah. <laughs> but right. <laughs> it's presented in such a great way that I thought I was yeah. like super. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I, I learned so much about because I mean, obviously, I'm like the the whitest dude ever, right? And I've heard about like, oh, I can't create black hair, but I didn't really understand. I was like, oh, they don't have the hairstyles. Okay, fair enough. But then I was like, what do you mean texture? And then I was like, oh, well, yeah, it makes sense that black hair has different texture to white hair. Like, of course, that's a thing. Why wouldn't I understand that? And then you started talking about stuff like salon culture and like, you know, being close to what's going on in salon so you can represent that in games. And I was like, salon culture? What the- I've never heard of that either. Like, mm. do- like that was just so, I yeah, so I yeah. just found- there was a lot I of found so much of that quite yeah there was a lot of learning for me too in, in making the video like I, I was fortunate to talk to Del Walker who works at Naughty Dog and also designed uh, Deadshot for Suicide Squad and like Deadshot in terms of like character design and in terms of the hair for that character like he looks fantastic um, but yeah now he works at Naughty Dog and I got to talk to him and he laid out things for me that I didn't realize right in terms of you know how um, technology has progressed and now how that's allowed for us to, to uh, get more detailed and try out different techniques with hairstyle because he uh, during the PS3 and Xbox 360 era he cited that as like kind of a weird in between era when you're talking about something like hair textures which would have been just straight up fucking polygons before you know on the PS2 sure. right now you're dealing with uh, strands of hair and generating hairs uh, generating hair based on uh, they called them cards uh, as opposed to straight up polygons and now that we're in the PS5 era one of the things that I mentioned was Spider-Man Miles Morales and the response to that character upon the reveal of that game originally, where you go on Twitter and everybody's like, oh, he looks so good. And his hair, like his hair looks fantastic. And there are interviews with some of the uh, character art team uh, members from Insomniac where they talk about for Miles Morales, they completely changed their rendering technique for the game to be strand based. And that's the thing they're able to do because of how far video games have come. And it's it's even to the point where the hair rendering for Miles is v- for, for on PS4 is very different from the hair rendering for Miles on the PS5. Um, wow. Yeah, and like Dell very much aligned the fact that yeah, we're at a point where this is a thing that can improve, and now you have less excuses than ever to get something like this wrong. Um, but then yeah, it was just fun also to talk to um, you know talking to you know my friend that I, I cite in the video. Um, as soon as they heard that I was making th- th- this video, she sent me a big text thread, and I was like, "Can I use this in the video?" And she was like, "Yeah, just don't say my name." That and story was so sad. Yeah, I was that like, was yeah. heartbreaking. Oh, can you like just briefly recount the story for? Like, oh, I wait for which one for Lianza the Lianza. talking about yeah. yeah. So yeah. Lianza's story is um uh is about like black hair discrimination, where you know I talk about in the video the idea that you've seen there there have been countless stories of folks who have gotten in trouble at school and it also extends to, to, to things like work right getting in trouble at work and stuff like that of you're wearing uh, a hairstyle in a certain way that might be a common style but because it's more ethnic and might not be more familiar to uh people that you're working with um, on the western side that becomes unacceptable and it gets you in trouble lianza who is the partner uh, to roger who is again the the editor and co-producer on the video um she has a story where in high school during her high school graduation after doing the walk across the stage she gets off the stage and immediately gets yelled at uh because of her hairstyle and you look at the pictures and you talk to her and she's like yeah my hair wasn't that crazy like and i look and looking i'm like no she has a pretty standard hairstyle right she has braided braided colored hair um but she got scolded at um um because of her her, her hair even though her classmates um uh, who didn't have ethnic hair even though they had colored hair, even though they were doing different things with their hairstyle, that that wasn't as big of an issue for um uh for them, and that was the thing. That was the moment for her, for her where she was like, "Oh, this sucks! Like this is a thing that that is actually a big problem, and it's the thing that made her mm-hmm. feel very terrible in the moment." But it's also just sure. not an it's not an uncommon story, right? Of people being like, "Yeah, I've been told that I look unprofessional uh because of my hairstyle, even though I'm rocking a very natural black hairstyle." Um, and yeah, like it's it's such a, it's it's such a sad story, but. Yeah, I think having a, that story in the video really for me helped cement the idea of like, hey, this hits on a this is this it, like it's not just a professional like, hey, let's just have hair. It's a personal thing for for so many people. 
you know, being able to go into a game and make yourself. She taught Leanne's also talked about um, some some of the games that she's interested in that she likes and like something like Animal Crossing, where in that game, that's the whole game about lifestyle. That's a whole game about, oh, you get to customize your character and build your own island and build your own house and do all, all this stuff. Even that game um, historically has had uh, big struggles in terms of representing black characters, where before, if you wanted a darker skin tone, you had to tan in Animal Crossing, which is insane that you would have to get a tan. And Animal Crossing has gotten better since then, right? You don't, that's not the case in uh, New Horizons, thank God. But yeah, even something like that, um, you know, you see. But it was very interesting and very um, awesome to get Leanne's story. And then also, like, you know, I had the story from uh, my friend who texted me and was like, yeah, like I'm, working on this fashion game our, our team doesn't have any black folks working on it and you know that it, it is such a struggle to put out or try and figure out these styles for a lot of women who play our game that want to be able to create themselves or create black characters but we don't know how to tackle this we don't know what styles are in right now we don't know um like like what kind of box braids to put in or what kind of hairstyles to put in or like even how to approach this right like even though game developers that are working on these games currently that might be lacking on their art teams, right. Or are or, or desire desiring to do something that helps, right. Put out work that helps even that they even oftentimes they know and they are struggling because, oh man, we don't have any black folks on our team. Like we don't know what to do with that. Um, and so the video for those who are listening and haven't checked it out, it does a deep dive, right. It's a 17 minute video. I, um, I compare it to, uh, Patriot Act, Hassan Minaj, right? Or late uh, last week tonight with John Oliver. I wanted to make that kind of video. It is something that is approachable, something that I would say anybody can watch and enjoy. And even if you're not into video games, I don't know why you're why you listening to this podcast if you're not into video games. But <laughs> if, you, if you're not into video games or you know somebody that's not into video games, like I think it's something that's still um, watchable and enjoyable and is still like is, is educational. Yeah. So go check out Definitely. the video. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave a link to it in the description below. And um, yeah, like really really recommend it it's not only like really great content i think it's just uh, just a really cool thing to learn about i think it's also important in its own way um so yeah definitely recommend giving it a click because it's uh 17 minutes flies by i promise you 17 minutes sounds like a lot on youtube these days but i promise you it flies by can you give us a hint as towards some other ones you're cooking up for the blessing show Ooh! Like a little, can we get two something? blessing exclusives in one show <laughs> oh i'm trying to think Oh man, because like now we're trying. To, I'm trying to keep these things as surprises now. Yeah, um, okay, so. I don't. And I don't know. I'll, I'll say there's one that I want to do that involves interviewing a lot of people. That's all I'll say. I don't know. I don't know if we'll get to the finish line with it because it's a kind of an ambitious idea, but it involves interviewing a lot of people. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's all I'll say. All right. Cool. Sweet. All right. Well, we got our final segment here. Uh, the this week in the way back. Uh, usually hosted by Gerard, but he's not here. Shout out to Gerard. I thought uh, we called it Games of Our Lives. Games of Our Lives. Oh, what? It I was going with what that. he was calling it. Lives. Now that he's not here, you're going to change it on him? What it's no. going to be called? No. With disrespect. <laughs> no, I would never. I'll text wow, him. Wow, that's a, a, yeah. a coup when he's out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> he arrives at the airport to learn that his segment has been renamed. <laughs> Speak, speaking of him, uh, we'll probably talk about it more in the next episode, but... Uh, I'm going to be at PAX East. Gerard is also going to be at PAX East. Gerard is hosting a, a cool event on Sunday. He's putting on a live performance. So go check out his socials for tickets for that. I'm just going to be walking around PAX East. I have no plans. I'm just going to check out some indie games. So if you see me, don't attack me. Uh, just, say, <laughs> just say hi to me, please. <laughs> um, so let's jump into this week in the way back or the games of our lives. Um, I'll go first. 12 years ago, uh, in 2011, Fight Night Champion released. And this is su significant to me because it's technically the last Fight Night game. And uh, really? I missed that series. It was an incredible series. It was really innovative. Uh, it was back when boxing was like just boxing and it wasn't like YouTuber boxing. Uh, <laughs> and it had some really incredible mechanics. Uh, Fight Night Round 3, Fight Night Champion really utilized analog sticks and directional movement of bodies and also just really, really good visuals and details to the characters where you see their faces get swollen, you'd see them get bruised and you'd see their posture change. And that was almost like an indicator as to your characters like endurance and health and stuff. And 
it was just such a creative series and I really love it. Uh, some developers, uh, the, the, the game is on the tip of my tongue, but some developers are trying to bring it back. Just that style of boxing game. Because right. EA clearly doesn't have any interest anymore. Uh, yeah, shout out to true. them, but Fight Night Champions mine. Did you guys ever play that Rocky boxing game on the that Xbox? Was, I didn't even know that was no. one. Yeah. I played the Rambo game, but no, I didn't play the Rocky one. <laughs> no, there was a Rocky boxing game on Xbox. It was sick. It was so good. Really? Oh, well, it could have been shit. I don't know. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So but like, yeah. I know I had a lot of fun with it. That's for sure. So my brothers and I, we loved that one. That was great. Yeah. That's good. Uh, to know. I'll go next. Uh, yeah, I can't believe that mm, 22 years ago today, Zone of Enders came out. Oh, that yeah. That was like, I know, right? I mean, what a was, game. What a game. Uh, what a demo. The, 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 yeah. What a demo. That's it, man. That was it. That was the reason we all bought Zone of Enders because it came with the demo for Metal Gear 2. The smartest marketing of all time. Uh, only only equaled by uh, Ground Zeroes, where they actually sold the demo <laughs> for oh, like yeah. a forty dollars yeah. box price. Well done, Konami. <laughs> they really uh, they've done some great work with uh, with demos. But yeah, Zone of Enders was 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 sick. It was fun, and I mean, obviously, I bought into it because of the demo thing. But it was still just a fun mech game that kind of like left an impression on me. Uh, the only other time I played mech games like that was in the arcade, where they had those like I forget the name of the game, but it was like. You would sit down and you would have two joysticks and you'd control two mechs yeah. in doing battle in an arena. What was the name of that game? I you know the one. Yeah. Rigs. Yeah. You know Mechanized the combat. Say again? Rigs. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully not, no. But I remember this one. I used to go to Time Zone and play this. And uh, that was the only other mech game I think I played. Uh, and then Zone of Enders, which, uh, mm. yeah, I really love. So, mm. to Kojima, our boy. He'll get on the podcast one day. He better. I mean, or we're going to have to go to Japan to visit him. Is that a we'll, we'll do a I'll cross- go tomorrow. We'll do, we'll, oh, 100% <laughs> I'll go tomorrow. We'll do a crossover because he's got a podcast. And we're, I mean, like, yeah, he only okay. really interviews very famous people. So if we became more famous than we are today, then maybe he'll invite us on. But I think we need to become significantly more famous. We need to so do it's... stuff bad so then we get more wow. famous. We need to, like, get in trouble <laughs> and pop yes. off on we Twitch. Need to, right. We need to, do it. like, I don't know. What, what would appeal to Kojima? Like... We need to. We need to make a film. <laughs> but it has to be uh, like in make French. A feature film. Ralph, yeah, yeah, it has to be you in start French. writing it. Jake, to, yeah, you edit right. it. I'll yes. <laughs> voice over it. I don't know. Yes, I want to be in it. And then that's it. You be. Yep. Yeah, let's do it. Hundred percent. And then we'll get on Kojima's podcast. Yeah. Blessing. What's your game? Uh, twenty-seven years ago, Sex Two came out on the NEC PC ninety. Excuse me. No, it's a, I'm looking at this website, and I'm like, this game called Sex Two apparently came out in Japan in twenty-seven years ago, which is crazy that they made a second one. But uh, twenty-five years ago, Yoshi Story came out on the Nintendo sixty-four. Um, and it's funny, like Yoshi Story is one that I I didn't play much, but my sisters played a lot of. You know, like I had the Nintendo sixty-four growing up that I had was mainly mine and i was i was playing 95 percent of the games on that thing but there were like a, only a couple of games that i had three older sisters growing up that they would uh, uh show up for and they would play and they were really into yoshi's story and so now to this day whenever i think of yoshi's story i couldn't tell you much about anything in that game aside from i the soundtrack is embedded in my brain and then like the art style sticks out to me as something that ignites so much nostalgia because the art style is so distinct i was like that's when they started doing the, um, I guess oh, you, the, um, Yoshi's Island was probably where they started doing like the arts and crafts kind of, kind of stuff. But Yoshi's story took that to another level where it is like, I don't know how, how I would describe it, like a storybook pop up feel. Uh, and yeah, like I get warm feelings when like I go back and I just listen to the soundtrack to, to Yoshi's story, even though that's not a game that I played that much. Oh, I, I like really that. like that. Yeah. Take, mm. It's like how certain smells can just take you back to a place in time for you. Yeah. The Yoshi's story music that's pretty sweet my game uh i did look through and there's like for some reason february big for sims expansions but um <laughs> well, i did sims a few weeks ago seven years ago february 26th was stardew valley oh which wow. i didn't wow. think was i don't know it feels like it's always been part of like the shining <laughs> so you know you've always been here always been there um <laughs> And no, Stardew was like, I didn't get like super, super, super into it. Like I didn't get to the point um, where I'm not going to name any names, but I know certain friends of mine who've made spreadsheets and like min-maxing the whole thing. And I never got into that, but I, I do remember 
um, a bunch of my friends and I got into it on holiday. We were on holiday together and we all brought our switches and we all were sat by the pool just playing Stardew Valley. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just, it's just a, a very chill game that I wish I had kind of the patience to go the distance with. But in terms of, you know, games that have had a cultural impact and also have kind of sp- spread to being outside of the game too, like the music is huge. There's like cross-stitching Stardew Valley. There's cookbooks mm. of Stardew Valley. There's the board game. I just think it's really, a really, I don't know, like it just scratches the itch that like I never personally experienced with Animal Crossing until New Horizons. And it's just such a quirky game and I can't believe it's seven years old. Bro, I went hard. In Stardew Valley. Yeah. Did you really? I was, I was, I was a surprised. Harvest Moon person, yeah. Uh, I played that whole thing back when it dropped on a, like a busted-ass MacBook. Like the old <laughs> MacBook that was like still so, like the white plastic. The it white was, like, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I played through it on that. I, I love that game. Yeah. The mm. music as well. Oh, man. Yes. Stardew Valley lo-fi and chill playlists have helped me through a lot of times. A lot of dark times. Well, with that, with that look down memory lane, that's another episode of the Friends Per Second podcast. We're here every other week, so be sure to check us out. Blessing, thank you so much for being our special guest today, filling in for us. Uh, Where can the people find you? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on uh, the show. I uh, I always love joining y'all. I hope. Do you guys have like a highest returning guest? Like, is there somebody that's been here more than twice? You and Eugene and Tam. Gene. Tam, Tam definitely. Twice, right? Okay, so no, I, need, I think I think he's like yeah, three like times now. Third, yeah. so. so I need to take you out Tam. Up, you, gotta, you have to take out Tam. <laughs> That's right. Oh, and maybe Gina tied. Okay, right. then Gene can stay then. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you so much for for bringing me back. I hope to be back again, and uh, it's always awesome talking to you guys. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Blessing Junior, and of course, uh, you can follow my work uh, on youtubecom slash games and that's where you can go to watch that new episode of the Blessing Show again, titled "We Need to Fix Black Hair in Video Games." Go watch that episode. Yeah, hit it for sure. Also, uh, Lucy, where can the folks find you? Hello, uh, you find me on Twitter at Lucy James Games. I'm. Uh on giant bomb and GameSpot, and here's peanut text because i know i'll get shit if i don't yeah i was Fuck wondering that. yeah peanut, what up so grumpy <laughs> she's uh, been a menace uh, all day but uh i'm doing stuff over there nice ralph uh yes you can find me right here on the shill up channel and uh i'm just playing destiny man you can find me in the tower you can find me and Ralph in the tower. That's right. Yeah, find me on <laughs> Neo Muna. The new, two. the new play. That's right. Exactly. We'll be running strikes and doing things together. That'll be that'll be it. Play I'm, Destiny. No, I'm joking. Don't. I'm Jake Baldino. No. You can find me on the internet, game ranks, whatever. Enjoy your destinies. Tie your shoes and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs>